So it is eight o'clock. Uh, my name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the Green Mountain Care Board, and I'm about to um, call this meeting to order. And the uh, first item that I am going to do is to appoint Michael Barber as the hearing officer for this rate review hearing. So Michael, whenever you are ready, you can take it away. Welcome everyone. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Barber. As you heard, I've been designated by the board chair to serve as the hearing officer for today's hearing. Uh, the purpose of this hearing is to take evidence and argument on MVP Health Plan's 2022 individual and small group rate filings. The docket numbers for these cases are GMCB-007-21 RR and GMCB-008-21 RR. Uh, representing MVP today are Gary Carnady, Ryan Long, and Michelle Bennett from the law firm Primer Piper, Eggleston and Kramer, and representing the Office of the Healthcare Advocate are Jay Angoff, Kylie Kuiper, and Eric Schulteis. Uh, I also want to recognize the, the board's attorney, Laura Beliveau, who will be conducting the direct examination of the board's actuaries, uh, as well as Gavin Boyles, I see, is on the line, um, General Counsel for Department of Financial Regulation. <clears throat> Because we are holding uh, this hearing remotely, before I go any further, I just wanted to call on each of the board members, the attorneys for the parties, and the court reporter to make sure that everyone can hear and be heard. So um, I'm just going to call off some names here, and if, if I call your name, if you could please take yourself off mute and just confirm that you can hear. Chair Mullen? Here. Board Member Holmes? Yes. Uh, board member Lunge. I couldn't hear you, Robin, if you said something. I still can't hear you. I'll keep going and if Robin, if you could maybe call in on the phone as a backup. Unless other folks can hear her. OK, um, board member Lucifer. Yes. Board member Pelham. Yes, and just uh, just to remind you sometimes that uh, both Robin and I in Berlin here have a weak Internet connection, so I do turn my picture off every now and then when things start breaking up and that seems to solve the problem, but um, hopefully it won't happen this time. Tom, you didn't throw me in there. My Internet speed is under two. In Colchester. Well, maybe you and I and Robin, we, we can have, <laughs> we can we can we can li listen in silence. If you're having problems, uh, you can turn your video off. Otherwise, if you could try and keep it on, that that would be preferred. But understand the internet issues. Um, uh, Miss Bellavo. I'm here. Mr. Carnaby. I'm here. And is Ryan not here? I don't I, see him. I, good morning. I'm here. Oh, well, you are. Good morning, Ryan. Well, I was going to say Ryan's uh, wife just had a baby, so he's been behind the, the moon. So I knew there was something. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bennett. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Angoff. I can hear everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. I can. Uh, Ms. Kuiper. I'm here. Mr. Schulteis. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, Sonny, are you? Yes, good morning. Good morning, thanks. So Robin, I'm going to come back to you. Can you try to say something? I can hear, yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Great. OK, great. I think that that is it. Um, 
So we are recording today's proceedings. Um, we also have a court reporter here, Sunny Danath, um, who's going to transcribe the proceedings, and we'll be we will be providing the parties with uh, a copy of the transcript as soon as we receive it. Uh, it looks like we have 37 uh, individuals participating uh, this morning via Teams. Because the board members are attending this meeting remotely, we also designated the board's offices in Montpelier as a physical location where members of the public can go to participate in the meeting. Uh, for members of the public who, who are present, we will be taking public comment at the close of the proceedings today. However, I can't say when we will be able to get to uh, the public comment portion of the meeting. So if you don't want to uh, sit through several hours of testimony, we are having a meeting this uh, Thursday afternoon from four o'clock to six o'clock that will be dedicated exclusively to hearing from the public on these filings uh, and the individual and small group filings from Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. Information about that meeting can be found by going to the Green Mountain Care Board's website and clicking on the rate review link. Additionally, you can submit uh, written comments to the board uh, through our website or by regular mail, and we will be taking public comments uh, through July 22nd on these filings. Um, so before we uh, kind of begin the hearing, I just wanted to remind the board and the parties to exercise caution regarding information uh, in the binders that's been marked confidential, as these matters can't be discussed in a public setting. If it becomes necessary to discuss confidential materials, we will need to go into an executive session, and we have a separate phone line for that purpose should we need it. Uh, so now let's turn to the exhibits. There was some um, emails that were sent out, so I just want to take a few minutes to make sure that we're all working from the same set of documents. Um, so we received exhibit binders on July 15th with 22 stipulated exhibits labeled 1 through 22, as well as two unstipulated exhibits labeled A and B. Uh, we then received five additional stipulated exhibits, 23 through 27. Um, we have also received revised versions of exhibits 4A and 5A, uh, as well as revised versions of exhibits 24 and 25, and then a note to remove exhibits 24A and 25A because they were being withdrawn. And then finally, uh, at Ms. Bellavo's request, an exhibit 28 was distributed yesterday, which the parties have stipulated to. So if I'm understanding correctly, if you have a binder, it should have 28 numbered exhibits and two lettered exhibits. Exhibits 4A and 5A have been revised, as well as exhibits 24 and 25 have been revised. <clears throat> and you should not have exhibits 24A or 25A in the binder any longer. Does anyone, well, first of all, uh, does any, do the parties agree with that <laughs> uh, characterization? Uh, yes, that was a very good summary of a busy weekend. So thank you very much. Does anybody need any time to update their binder or, or are we all set to go forward? I did see Jay's lips move, but I don't know what he said. You're still muted, Jay. Still muted. Sorry for moving my lips when I was thinking. I agree with the uh, with what's in the binders today. No objection. Thank you. So unless anyone needs a copy of, of one of those documents or some time to make the revisions, I'm going to proceed. Um, so 
I guess at this point, I, I assume neither party objects to me admitting exhibits one through 28 into evidence. Is that correct, Gary and Jay? No objection. No objection. OK, then consider that done. Um, and then I understand that the parties wanted to deal with exhibits A and B at the beginning of the hearing and that there is a relevance objection. Mr. Carnegie, could you please elaborate? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the healthcare advocates proposed exhibits A and B are two pieces of evidence from last year's uh, rate hearing. Uh, exhibit A is MVP's 13 page single spaced actuarial memorandum regarding each and every aspect of the 2021 rate filing. Exhibit B is a 10 page single spaced MVP in a, interrogatory response to 21 questions with, with another 10 pages of exhibits. Simply put, the HCA is improperly attempting to relitigate the past. We object to the admission of these exhibits and further move in lemonade to bar HCA counsel from asking questions about the 2021 rate filing. This is supposed to be a streamlined process, administrative process, tight statutory deadlines, and I fear that you open Pandora's box if you go down this road. Will the HCA be cross-examining witnesses about 2016 demographics? Will I be allowed to cross-examine Ms. Lee about her recommendation on a medical trend from 2017? and some page from an actuarial memorandum back then where it turned out she was wrong about something. Uh, where does it end? If this evidence and inquiry is beyond the scope of the rate 2022 rate filing, that's allowed. The next year we'll need to schedule five days of hearing, not one. We'll set bad precedent. So I'd like to go through the three legal grounds why we object uh, to this these exhibits going in. First, the board has already ruled on this issue this year and declined to put through interrogatory questions attempting to litigate who was right last year in their predictions. These questions are out that outside the scope of the rate review hearing this year. On June 7th, the HCA submitted 10 suggested actuarial interrogatories to the board and requested that they pass them on to MVP. MVP objected to actuarial question four on the following grounds, not relevant, contrary to precedent, not author authorized because they didn't seek information about the 2022 rate filing and a waste of resources. So let me, let me read you the question that they had posed. In MVP's 2021 BHC filing, MVP assumed that providers would resume performing a normal level of elective services starting in mid-May 2020, and providers would perform 110% of their prior elective service volume beginning in August of 2020 and ending in April 2021. Applying the same definition of quote normal as used in MVP's 2021 BHC filing, did a normal level elective services in fact begin in May of 2020? If not, when during 2020, if at all, did a normal level of elective services begin? If MVP had used the actual date on which a normal level of services began rather than the mid-May 2020 date, MVP assumed in its 2021 BHC filing, by how much would the increase sought in MVP's 2021 BHC filing have been reduced, expressed as both a percent and in dollars? There's a second similar question under number four. So the question is, is this what the board wants to do? Do we want to have detailed questions all day about the 2021 rate filing? Is that what this hearing is going to be about? Well, question four, portion of which I just read you was not passed through by the board. So you've already decided this and the answer is no. The second ground, the proposed exhibits for the 2021 rate filing are both irrelevant and immaterial and outside the scope of the board's 2022 rate filing review. The board's own rule gives it authority to limit, strike or terminate irrelevant or immaterial evidence. That's rule 2.307F. Evidence from last year's rate filing has no bearing on whether this year's proposed rates meet the statutory criteria. Evidence from last year is outside the scope of the board's review. That's pursuant to rule 2.301B. The board's review is limited by its rules to information about whether this year's proposed rate rates meet the statutory criteria. Same rule. Third reason the evidence is not material 
to the extent that the HCA argues that it would be even collaterally uh, relevant, it would be a waste of time to have a mini trial on issues not relevant to the board's decision this year. The Vermont Supreme Court uh, reviewing a decision of the Vermont Public Service Commission, which is currently the PUC, has explained that, quote, where an administrative agency has authority to choose the criteria determinative of an issue of fact, it may reject evidence which has no materiality in view of the criteria adopted. That's the petition of Central Vermont Public Service Corp at 116 VT 206. The Vermont Supreme Court has explained that collateral evidence that requires time consuming and confusing mini trials to assess its relevance to the instant case should not be permitted. The Vermont Supreme Court upheld the trial court's decision to exclude evidence of other people besides a defendant who had motive to harm a victim because of sexual misconduct. Quote, weighed against the limited probative value of defendants proffered evidence was the prospect of confusion of the issues by a 20 witness mini trial of Gendron for sexual misconduct with no real connection to the offense being tried. That's State v. Gibney, 2003, Vermont, 26. I would also point the board to State v. Burke, 2012, Vermont 50. The Vermont Supreme Court upheld a trial court's decision in malpractice action against a dentist to exclude the evidence of other patients whom defendant allegedly mistreated, reasoning that, quote, the trial court reasonably found that the proffered evidence could require a time-consuming and potentially confusing mini-trial on each of the four unrelated cases, determine its facts, similarity, and relevance to the case at bar, and would be unfairly prejudicial to the defendant. That's wish be lactose. Um, that's 2005 Westlaw 6154120. That's a rocket docket case, a three-member panel. So it's for persuasive purposes only. The point of all of that is um, we, M MVP believes that it would be folly to get into a situation where we're relitigating past rate filings, uh, trying to point out what MVP got right, right and what Ms. Lee got wrong. Um, it's a waste of our time. And this is an important ruling, I think. And we ask that the board not allow exhibits A or B into evidence. And based on your prior decision in Vermont law, you further bar HCA counsel from asking questions about the 2021 rate file. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Angoff, do you have a response to the objection? Yes, I do. Thanks very much, Mr. Hearing Officer and Mr. Chair and members. I may be missing something, but I don't think this is a close case, a close issue. MVP is asking the board to give it money, to give it more money than either MVP or Blue Cross have ever asked the board to give either carrier in the past. We think that it is always relevant for the board to assess the credibility of the party making the request for more money. And in this case, there are certain statements that MVP made last year, which are inconsistent with statements it's made in this year's rate filing. For, so for both those reasons, that there's inconsistency between this year's rate filing and last year's, and because credibility is always relevant, um, we, we certainly think that they are. Uh, Hang in there. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think someone does not have their uh, microphone muted. So if everyone could take a minute to make sure that they have their mics muted, except for the attorneys who are speaking, that'd be appreciated. So, Mr. Hearing Officer, is my voice coming through all right? Yeah. So, if you were. Uh, if you were going to hire a plumber, you'd want to know how he's done in the past fixing faucets. If you're looking for an investment advisor, you're going to want to know how that investment, how accurate that investment advisor has been in the past. All we're asking is for one 13 page document and and one page of another uh, document that I would question the witness about. We're not going to go back. I mean, this stuff about going back 20 years, of course we're not, or 15 years or 10 years or even five years. Uh, and uh, I agree, you don't want to get into that. But to go back one year to assess the credibility and the accuracy of the uh, 
of the party is certainly reasonable. Mr. Carnegie talked about a 20 witness mini trial. <laughs> We're not looking for any 20 wit witness mini trial. We got one 13 page document and one exhibit. If they're asking you for a lot of money, you certainly have the right to know how accurate they've been in the past when they've asked you for money. <clears throat> okay. Um, I am going to overrule the objection. Um, I, I think that the accuracy of MVP's projections in the current filing uh, is obviously a fact of consequence in this case, and the accuracy of MVP's projections in last year's filing um, and statements made uh, with respect to those projections um, has probative value with respect to the the issue um, to the extent there are similarities between last year's filing and this year's filing. Um, I I hear the concern about um, avoiding uh, a mini trial and the concern about confusion of the issues, um, waste of time, but to the extent that it is a, as limited as Mr. Angoff uh, has represented. I'm, I'm not going to uh, exclude it on that ground. So, um, I'm overruling the objection. Um, Mr. Carnegie, was there any uh, other grounds for um, objection, or otherwise, well, I'm going to admit it in the evidence at this time? I think I gave you plenty of grounds. Uh, what I would uh, indicate is I intend to object along the way if if uh, if uh, questioning goes beyond the parameters that you just uh, referenced in your ruling. Yeah, and let me add to that the, the credibility uh, issue that Mr. Angoff um, just stated that there are statements in there that are inconsistent with uh, statements that are being made in this filing. So, does either party have anything further that we need to discuss before we move to opening statements? I don't believe so. Not for the HCA. Okay, uh, then Mr. Carnegie, would you like to make an opening statement? Yes, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity today. Uh, I represent MVP again in the 2020 rate filing for individual and small group. MVP, MVP is seeking a 17.03 overall average premium rate increase for individual and 4.97% increase for small group. This hearing will again provide MVP an opportunity to explain its rate filings and answer any questions of the board. We appreciate this opportunity. The board's challenge this year is different than what it faced last year. Last year, you had to determine how to set rates in the middle of an extraordinarily uncertain time in the middle of the COVID pandemic. Thankfully, this year, your task is much easier. You have to determine how to set rates for a post-COVID 2022, a much more predictable time. In Vermont in particular, with a vac vaccination rate of 80% and counting, we're quickly getting back to normal. People are going out to dinner again, seeing their doctors again, undergoing their medical procedures again. I think we would all agree that the pandemic was a once in a lifetime event for all of us. 2020 was an extraordinary year like no other. It was an outlier. And that is what we would ask you to keep in mind as you hear the evidence today. 20 and 20 was like no other. I'm in the legal business, and in the legal business, we have what is called precedent. If a Vermont court makes a decision based on the facts and circumstances of a case, it will look to similar past cases decided by the Vermont Supreme Court. The more similar the facts and circumstances of the past case, the greater reliance the court will place on that past case. 
if the facts and circumstances of the past case are a lot different, then the court is less likely to rely on it. It is therefore less reliable. Courts are not inclined to make a much larger leap to rely on a past case that is different or a factual outlier. I believe that the Green Mountain Care Board has a similar task before it today. The evidence you will hear today will show you that the business of actuaries is very similar to what courts do. It is true that actuaries have to make assumptions all the time, but the more assumptions they have to make to get their data to align with future forecasting, the less reliable the forecast becomes. The evidence will show that this year MVP took a simpler approach than l &E. MVP relied on pre-COVID data from the 2019 experience period and trend and then made adjustments for 2022 to set its rates, apples to apples. In stark contrast, l &E relied on 2020 data, COVID pandemic outlier data, and then had to make a number of assumptions to tease out the COVID impact and get to apples and apples. The evidence will show that l and &E took an approach that required a lot more assumptions with a wide range of outcomes dependent upon interdependent moving parts in 2020, such as suppressed utilization, pent up demand, no more COVID lab tests, no more utilization review rule restrictions, and skewing risk adjustments, to name a few. You will be presented with these two options of how to set the rates this year. We respectfully request that the board choose the more reliable approach used by MVP, apply the KISS test, keep it simple. The result will be consistent with your statutory charge. 2022 rates that will be aligned with a post-COVID world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ingo. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer. We'll get into a lot of riveting discussion about things like morbidity and trend, um, but I'd like to ask the board at the beginning to just step back and look at this proposed rate increase from a common sense perspective. MVP is asking the board to give it more money, a 17% increase than either MVP or Blue Cross has ever asked the board to give in the past. Again, I might be missing something, but it doesn't make sense to me. L&E has already found that MVP paid out less in 2020 than the amount it used to justify its 2021 rates. That means that the 2020 rates for MVP were excessive, and it suggests, doesn't demonstrate because we're only halfway through the year, but it suggests that also the 2021 rates were excessive. I don't get how you get 2020 rates being, 2020 payouts being less than the data that MVP relied on to justify its 2021 rates. I don't get how that translates into a 17% increase. So I just asked the board while you're, when you're listening to MVP's testimony to keep in mind three words and they're really three tests. Ask yourself whether this, whether the testimony you're hearing meets these three tests. And the first is transparency. Are they telling you what happened, what they projected last year, what they actually paid out last year, how that differs, and how the projections they made last year for 2021 differ from actual so far in 2021? Are they being transparent about what they've actually taken in, what they've actually paid out? Second test is accountability. If it turns out that they did take in much more than they projected they take in and or paid out less than they projected they paid out, that they would pay out, what happens to that money? Did they rebate it? It doesn't look like that, but what happens to that money? How, how does the MVP policyholder um, benefit, if at all, from that money? Is it rebated? Is it, is it included in this year's rate filing? It should be, in our view, one or the other. There's got to be some accountability to the extent that the company has taken in more than it has 
uh, th than it projected or paid out less than it projected. And then the third word I'd like you to keep in mind and to use as a test, and in some ways it's the most important, is humility. We're all engaged in guesswork here. It's educated guesswork, but it's still guesswork. MVP has been wrong in the past. Other actuaries have been wrong in the past. That's the nature of the actuarial business. And they're going to be wrong in the future. Nobody knows. And to the extent that MVP tries to convey the impression that there is uh, that, that there's certainty in any one number, uh, obviously we'd argue that that's a false impression. We're all trying to do the best we can. It's all, and I would just ask the board to keep in mind, MVP has been wrong in the past, and there is no reason to expect necessarily that they're, that they're going to be right this year. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer. Okay, thank you. So uh, now we'll turn it over to you, Mr. Connerty, to call your first witness. Thank you very much. Uh, MVP calls Matt Lombardo. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I don't see you on the video. Uh, let me take a minute to. Do you have your video on? It should be. Yeah, I can see the light uh, right next to the camera. Oh, there you are. OK. Um, Mr. Lombardo, could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr. Carnegie? Thank you very much. Good morning, Matt. How are you? Good. How are you, Gary? Good. Are you all situated? Do you have your binder with exhibits? Um, I, I will be full disclosure because of all the cross ups and some changes in the office. Um, I'm working off a combination of electronic and uh, printed documents, so I would just ask that if you refer to an exhibit, please include the name of the exhibit as well. That will just help me. I'm happy to do that, and I would just uh, let the board know that there may be a time when Matt's looking over at his screen rather than at all of you as he talks, and so I apologize for that. Um, uh, we're doing the best we can. Okay, thank you, Matt. So would you please uh, take your full name? Matthew Lombardo. And Matt, who's your employer? MVP Healthcare. And uh, what is MVP Health Plan Inc., please? It's the uh, nonprofit HMO subsidiary of MVP Healthcare. And MVP Health Plan Inc. was the filer of these two rate filings, correct? Correct. And what's your position at MVP? Senior Leader of Actuarial Services. And are you a member of any associations? Yes, I'm a fellow in the Society of Actuaries and a member in the American Academy of Actuaries. And how long have you worked at MVP? Uh, about 14 years. And how long have you worked in the health insurance industry? About 16 years. And have you been involved in prior rate filings uh, at the Green Mountain Care Board and, and in Vermont generally? Yes. Uh, I've worked on every exchange filing, so this is numbers nine and ten plus uh, Vermont filings predating the the ACA. And Matt, what are your job duties at MVP Healthcare? Uh, commercial rate setting, which in in the state of Vermont as well as the state of New York, uh, I'm responsible for reserving, oversee the actuarial aspects of value based contracting, as well as forecasting. Um, financial competitive intelligence where we look at publicly available documents from competitors to stack ourselves up as well as ad hoc uh, strategic initiatives thank you Matt, what i'd like to do is get uh everyone acclimated to the uh, exhibits and go through those with you so would you please refer to the exhibit list uh, which uh is the most recent one that the general counsel made reference to which has uh, 1 through 28 on it. Do you have that in front of you? I do. <clears throat> so referring to that, if you look at exhibits 1 through 10, 
12 through 15 and 23 through 25. Those exhibits include MVP's individual and small group rate filings, responses to objections, and you've reviewed all of those and are familiar with them, correct? Correct. And you'll adopt them as your testimony in this case, correct? Correct. And that would include any uh, confidential versions that we have in the binder, correct? Correct. And then exhibit 11, 11 Matt, that is your current CV, correct? Correct. You prepared that? Yes, I did. And then exhibit 16 is the July 6, uh, 2021 pre-filed testimony of yours. You've reviewed that and are familiar with it, correct? Correct. Adopt that as your testimony, correct? Correct, I do. And then exhibit 17 is the July 6 actuarial opinions of LNE, the Green Mountain Care Board actuary. You've reviewed that and are familiar with it? I am. And then exhibits 18 and 19 of the two DFR Department of Financial Regulation uh, Solvency Analysis uh, letters. Have you reviewed those and are you familiar with them? I am. And exhibit 20 is uh, July 8th, 2021 MVP's calculation of LE's July 7 actuarial memorandum. Uh, you helped prepare that? Correct. And you're familiar with it, correct? Correct. And then exhibit 21 is MVP's supplemental pre filed testimony dated July 12th, 2021. You're familiar with that and adopted as your testimony? I do. And then exhibit 22 is uh, Ms. Lee's pre filed testimony of, of um, <coughs> July 13th, I believe. I may have my date wrong. Um, you've reviewed that and are familiar with it? Correct. And these, these exhibits, uh, each of them have little numbers in the bottom right hand corner they should be in color for people's um, in people's binders um, so when you and i talk today and i ask you questions we'll refer to numbered pages those will be the numbers we'll be referring to matt okay yes and also generally there are two rate filings here exhibit one and exhibit two um, to the extent that we're referencing uh issues today we relate to both rate filings correct Correct. So let's start at a high level, Matt, and just explain the increase numbers, and then we'll identify LNE's recommendations. Okay, and then we'll get into greater detail later in your testimony. Okay. Okay. So if you would please go to Exhibit One and the second page of Exhibit One. I'm there. Okay. And you see in the, the top left hand corner, there's a general information and then down below it says overall rate impact. Do you see that? Yes. And this is for the individual filing, correct? Correct. And what's the uh, uh, proposed overall rate impact we're seeking this year? 17.03%. Okay, and that would be the average premium rate increase, correct? Correct, for the individual block of business. And then go to exhibit two. That would be the small group, correct? Yes, correct. And similarly, go to page two. Okay. And in that same area under general information, what's the overall rate uh, increase we're seeking this year? 4.97% in the small group market. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Next, I would ask you to go to exhibit 17 which is LNE's actuarial memorandum. And go to page 21 of that document, please. Okay. Waiting for the board to catch up. Just hold on a second. Chair Mullen, I just want to make sure you're with us. Are you in that exhibit? Thank you very much. 
Okay, so Matt, there's a table on page 21 and there's a row down at the bottom of it that says total proposed rate change. Do you see that? Yes. And there's a 14.4%. Uh, do you see that number? I do. And that's for individual, correct? Correct. So uh, what, what is that indicating in terms of l &E's view and any reduction to our rate? Uh, l &E is recommending a reduction from 17.03% to 14.4%. That's a reduction of approximately 22 to 2.3%. Uh, it's it's a little different than just taking a straight subtraction. You actually want to just compare the two, the ratio of the two percentages to, to arrive at the rate increase. So it's a, a multiplicative approach. Is that right? Correct. And, and similarly, if you go in the small group uh, column and then the total proposed rate change is a 3.3 for small group. Do you see that? Yes. And could you provide a similar explanation about what the delta is this year between MVP and L&E? Yes, uh, again, you would take the division of the two. So we had proposed a 4.97% increase. L&E is recommending 3.3. Um, I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but I believe it's approximately 1.6%, uh, 1.5 to 1.6% reduction to our rates is what L&E is recommending. Okay, so although straight uh, subtraction, you'd have 1.7 using this multiplicative approach, you end up with the number you just described, correct? Correct. Okay, also on the numbers, again, this year the board has asked us to, to check l &E's math, which we do now, uh, and uh, we filed a response after seeing their memorandum. And just generally, were we able to fully do that this year to check their math? No, we weren't. Um, it's because of there's methodology differences between the calculation that l and &E is proposing for our rate adjustments versus the way that we filed our rates. Thank you. So back to 17, if you go to page five, please, page five. Let me know when you're there. I'm there. This is uh, under a heading l and &E analysis. The second paragraph says uh, the combination of the other rating components will help simplify the comparison to the prior 2021 filing. So could you explain to the board just generally what did l and &E do in terms of looking at these two uh, separate filings? Yeah, MVP utilized 2019 data to set our rates. Um, and then we populated the federally prescribed URRT, the Unified Rate Review Template, using 2020 data to be consistent with uh, the federal guidance that was that was issued. Um, MVP chose to use 2019 data because, as Gary described, as you described, um, there was less unknowns. In 2020, there were so many outliers that would make it challenging to just come up with a single point estimate of what the normalization factor is. As an actuary, our job is to project project claims and, and costs um, in the in the projection period that would that would tie out. Given how abnormal 2020 was, um, it's really challenging to come up with a single point estimate. L and E chose to use the URRT, which is using 2020 data, to come up with adjustment factors to describe our rate increase. Okay. And as to l and &E's analysis, rather than doing, uh, setting aside the, the URRT issue, rather than doing two different analysis for small, small group and individual, they combined the numbers for purposes of their analysis, correct? Yes, correct. And you don't take issue with that just for, for their purposes of, of analyzing the rate. There's other issues that you have a concern about, correct? Yeah, I, yes, correct. I mean, I um, I think Alan e is using, we filed two URTs, one for individual, one for small group. They're using those items separately to come up with the adjustments and then blend them together for a simplified document that you could consume. Um, but we are taking, we're taking issue not with that approach, more with just the fact that they're using 2020 data in the URT. Thank you very much. 
Uh, Matt, would you please go to page 20 of Exhibit 17? I'm there. <clears throat> and here, uh, l &E's making rec recommendations. I counted there's seven of them for the combined markets, correct? Correct. So let's go through each one and just we're going to identify where we have agreement or disagreement. Then we'll talk about those disagreements later. OK, we're just identifying. So let's start with the first item, uh, the hospital budgets. Do we uh, agree or disagree with what they're saying about hospital budgets? And does it have any material dollar difference at this point uh, in, in terms of a dispute? We agree with l and &E. um, in general, we are, are we want to align our claim trends and our rate filing with what is ultimately approved. So to the extent there's more information between the time we filed our rates in early May and today, uh, we would, you know, we support making those changes so the two are aligned, regardless of which direction that goes in, as long as our rates change in the same direction um, as the trends, then we support that. We have reviewed all the uh, hospital budgets that have been submitted and put those through our rate filing. Um, and there is a small a, a small adjustment that would be made based on the proposed hospital budgets. Um, if I recall, it's approximately 0.1% in the small group market, and it's about 0.05% in the individual market. OK, so as to hospital budgets, and you'll get more detail later, there isn't really a material uh, uh, difference it, it, that would impact the rate filing, correct? Correct. And the second item is a reduction of the pharmacy trend. Do we agree or disagree with l and &E on that point? We disagree. And the third item is the removal of COVID booster cost. Do we agree or disagree with l and &E? We disagree. And the fourth item is the reduce the COVID-19 adjustment. Do we agree or disagree, or do you have some other sort of issue with this? This goes back to, we disagree, and that goes back to the fact that um, we're using 2019 data to set our rates, so COVID-19 adjustment isn't, isn't required. 2019 data didn't include COVID-19 impacts on our claims. We're expecting that there's going to be a couple of minor changes, which we've accounted for in 2022 due to COVID, which is a shift in telehealth. Uh, there's been increased telehealth utilization, as well as we are projecting a COVID booster shot, as we as we mentioned in the prior bullet. So the fifth bullet, reflection of updated risk adjustment transfers. Do we agree or disagree? We disagree with that. Uh, but just so the board understands, you, their uh, L and E is indicating that we should increase our rates. So why would we disagree with that? We disagree because of the fundamental premise that we should be using 2019 data versus 2020 data to to set our rates. Risk adjustments intent is to normalize morbidity in the market, um, and you should always align risk adjustment year with the experience period year. Because we're using 2019 data to set our rates, 2019 risk adjustment should be utilized. l and &E is recommending that you, we make an adjustment because of 2020 risk adjustment because they're using the URT. We fundamentally, again, disagree with that approach. Uh, 2020, again, it was, it was an outlier year. Uh, there were suppressed claims for some time. Prior offs were suspended. Risk adjustment could be skewed because of uh, COVID hospitalizations and diagnoses. There's a whole list of items that could be skewing 2020 data. So we don't believe that you should be using 2020 data to set rates. We should use 2019 projected for an additional year without having to make an adjustment for all those assumptions and cope with COVID impacting 2020. Um, but it is worth noting that if the board adopts l &E's recommendation to use 2020 data, then we do support making this change because again, we need we we need to line up experience period year and risk adjustment year. Thank you. So for our purposes, just so the board can follow the fifth item we disagree with. How about the sixth item? Update to bronze CDHP cost sharing. We agree with that. And uh, does that have a, a material impact on the rate filing? 
overall it does not um the standard bronze high deductible plan had to change the the benefit design between the time we submitted rates and today um, the impact on that plan specifically is 0.18 percent when you blend that across our entire block of business it's an immaterial impact then the seventh item is the impact of the American Rescue Plan Act on claims. Do we agree or disagree with l &E on that? We disagree. Thank you. So this year of the seven recommendations, we respectfully disagree with five, correct? Correct. And the two that we agree on don't appear to have a material impact on the rate as filed? Based on the information available with hospital budgets today, I agree with that. So I want to follow up. You've already testified some about uh, this disagreement about 2019 and 2020. Be but before we go through all these particular bullets and where we disagree and the particulars of that, just generally, can you explain the disagreement uh, that we have, respectful disagreement with L&E about using 2020 data versus the 2019 data with additional trend? Yes. Yeah, so. Um, I think I kind of hit on it, but as an actuary, our goal is to align costs with our to align our projected costs with revenue collected uh, and meeting statutory reserve requirements. 2020, because of suppressed utilization for some time, unknown impacts of uh, prior authorization, there was coke uh, being suspended. That's that's obviously skewing our data. Uh, there were COVID lab tests that were that we experienced in 2020. Risk adjustment is also skewed potentially because of you know there were new diagnoses added to the risk adjustment model to account for for COVID utilization um, and diagnoses. When you account for all those items, there's a wide range of normalization factors that you need to apply. If you're going to use a data that is such an abnormal outlier year. Uh, you need to normalize your data to get back to your projection for 2022. We chose to kind of bypass that approach because we kind of our assumption was why even bother dealing with all those unknowns? We should just use 2019 data when COVID didn't exist until you know it wasn't really it wasn't really prevalent in the state of Vermont um, in 2019 because given the high vaccination rate and everything that we're seeing today. We're getting back to normal. We think 2022 is going to be a normal, a more normal year, assuming that um, some of these new items like increased telehealth utilization are accounted for. So a fundamentally different approach. That's correct. So let's go to the particular disagreements. Thank you, Matt. Let's start yeah. with bullet number two on page 20, which is the pharmaceutical trend. Uh, this dispute, if you look at that second bullet, is a reduction of 1.3%. That's what L&E is recommending, correct? Correct. So I want to ask you first generally about both medical trend and pharmaceutical trend. Are they both driving underlying increases in rates for 2022? Yes. So let's start with the medical trend. Please go to page eight of exhibit 17. I'm ready when you are. At the top, there's a heading total allowed medical trend. Do you see that? Yes. Read the sentence underneath that. Based on the information available, LNE considers the 6.7% total allowed medical trend to be reasonable and appropriate. So as to medical trend, we have agreement with LNE, correct? Correct. And explain how you derived the medical trend this year. There's two components to medical trend. Uh, an allowed medical trend is utilization and unit cost trends. For utilization trend, we did do perform a simulated forecast of utilization, and we had such a wide range of outcomes because of changes in our membership. Um, the percentile difference was, was very wide. l &E had done an analysis using our data and our competitors' data to get a feel for the overall utilization trend in the market um, using non-COVID data a couple of years ago or last year even, and they arrived at a 1% was a recommended utilization trend. So that's what we're building into our rates for utilization trend. Again, we expect that the future is going to 
we can ignore COVID from our, the 2020 COVID year from our data, 1% will resume in the future. For unit cost, um, we have claims that are, you know, there's, there's providers and hospitals that are um, negotiated with directly by MVP, as well as we rely on a third party, uh, a third party carrier for a national network to provide national network access to members. And then there's the third component, which is um, claims that are governed by the Green Mountain Care Board. For the New York, uh, for our New York trends that are directly negotiated trends with providers and facilities, we are including um, our best estimate of future trends as well as actual contracted rate increases. And then for the Green Mountain Care Board trends, we are assuming that 2020 and 2021 are the approved hospital budgets for each respective year. And then 2022's unit cost trend will be equal to the 2021 approved uh, unit cost trends. Okay. Let's talk about pharmaceutical then, Matt. If you go to exhibit one and page 15 is where we have an RX trend factors heading. OK, I'm there. So you can refer to that if you need to, but I have more of a general question, and that is uh, what is happening this year in terms of pharmaceutical cost increases for 2022? Uh, we're seeing a big increase in costs, um, and that's primarily due to specialty drugs. Those are the low utilization, high unit cost drugs. They're now you know, about 50% of overall pharmacy cost. Um, the, the FDA has expanded some indications where there's more use cases or more approved utilization of of some of these specialty drugs. That's expanding, obviously, and increasing the pharmacy costs that we're experiencing. Um, it's worth noting too that if you look at our if you look at our pharmacy trends by year, which isn't clearly laid out in the rate filing, we have an annualized trend that's presented in Exhibit 2B. But if you were to break down our unit co our unit cost and utilization trends for pharmacy, you'd see that 2020 trend was the highest of the three years. So we have 2020 trend, 2021 trend, and 2022 trend. 2020 trend was the highest if you isolated that year of trend. And then 2021 and 2022 averaged around 12%. But over the course of three years, we averaged approximately 15.3%. Um, in the URT, for reconciling purposes so that we could crosswalk between the URT back to our exhibit 2B of our rate filing. We populated that exhibit with the three-year average trend, which included that higher than uh, higher than average in 2021 and 2022 um, trend for 2020. Great. We'll, we'll get to that in a little more detail. Thank you. Um, how does your current relationship with an effort of your PBM providing for prescription drug services, lower costs for members? Well, we, um, right now we're, we're contracting with CVS. Um, we've been contracting with them as a PBM for a number of years at this point. When our contract is up, we do uh, take them out for an RFP um, to ensure that we're getting best cost. But we do have to focus on the net net cost of, of a PBM, which is net claim costs, which includes reductions for rebates, as well as administrative costs, because uh, PBMs also help manage back-end systems, claims processing, a pharmacy, a phar pharmacy claim trend processing, and items such as that. Uh, even during our contract period, we do mid-market, uh, we do market checks to ensure that we're getting best-in-class discounts, and um, we sign our contracts with certain clauses to, to ensure that you know, if certain metrics aren't met, that we'll be able to get a refund back from them for not meeting performance metrics. And our our PBM contract is a multi-year contract, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. It's not as if MVP could just jump from one PBM to an, to another in any given year, correct? That's correct. And it would it is a big undertaking because of all the back end claims processing changes that you have to make. And in terms of uh, how the, the PBM has been doing, do you, does MVP see any reason to make a change in your PBM relationship? I'm not close enough to uh, 
very distinctly answer exactly where we are in our contract. Um, what I can say is that as of right now, um, we've you know we're we're continuously managing our formulary and managing them, and we don't plan to make a change at this point. When our contract is up, though, we will take them out for an RFP to ensure that we're getting the best costs available. Thank you. If you look at MVP pharmaceutical cost projections as a percentage of total costs, how is MVP doing in managing costs? Yeah, um, interesting that you bring that up because you know we we recognize our competitor did have some uh, very favorable pharmacy trends or rebate figures in the rate filing. So we we wanted to compare, you know, as a benchmark, uh, not just for this rate filing, but as a, as an organization, how are we doing? Um, so we looked at our URT versus our competitors to compare pharmacy costs net of rebates as a percentage of the total allowed medical plus pharmacy costs. And what we found was what we're both projecting for 2022 are reasonably well aligned. Uh, said another way, it doesn't appear that we're an outlier in any way for our 2022 projections. When you look at our pharmacy costs um, as a percentage of our overall costs. Thank you. Next, Matt, I want to ask you about Alanis Pharmacy Trend Adjustment, what they recommended. Would you please go to Exhibit 21? Exhibit 21. This is your supplemental pre-file testimony. Let me know when you're there. Bear with me. Take your time. OK, I'm there. Terrific. And if you please go to question five. And then there's an answer. Um, I'm going to read question five to you. Please explain concerns MVP has regarding the pharmacy trend adjustment recommended by l and &E in its actuarial memorandum. So uh, I, I thought it might be helpful for you to kind of walk through your testimony here and explain this to the board, please. Yeah. I I think the way that we responded here is probably a little more concise and clear than what I described a few minutes ago. So I'm just going to read the, the second paragraph, um, starting with the second sentence. The MVP rate filing applies three years of trend to 2019 data, with the 2020 over 2019 trend being the highest. The URT is populated with 2020 claim data, which is then trended for two years to 2022. MVP populated the URRT with uniform ph pharmacy trends, which represent the three-year average trend for 2020 through 2022, even though the URRT is only trending data for 2021 and 2022. MVP took this approach because the rate filing does not show separate pharmacy trends for each year, and the trends shown in the URRT reconciled back to exhibit 2B of the rate filing. So the calculation, um, but if you were to take our 20, if you were to remove the 2020 trend from our URT, you would arrive at uh, trends of 11.7% for, for 2021 and 2022 for and 12.1% for the small group market. So if we were to make the change from those, you know, if l &E's recommended trend of 9.8% or applied to those lower factors, the, uh, the rate adjustments would be 0.5% and 0.7% for the individual and small group, mar small group markets, respectively, rather than the 1.3% reduction they recommended. Thank you. And um, when we were preparing for this, I kept saying yurt, which apparently is not what the URRT is, is described as. But what, what is the URRT, please? Um, it is a federally prescri prescribed um, document that's supposed to show some of the high level assumptions used to develop a rate. Is the URRT worksheet intended to prescribe a rate development methodology? It is not. If you would please go to exhibit 17, the l &E memorandum at page nine, please. Okay. 
do you see there's a table below a heading that says historical allowed RX trends? Yes. And this is L and E's uh, discussion around RX, RX trends. Can you explain the table at the top, how they uh, are doing predictions and issues you have with it? Yeah, l &E is comparing our projected trends from refilings to the actual trend that emerged. Um, and there are differences between those two columns, but what they're not capturing, our issue is that they're not capturing changes in our, in our market or in our membership base. Um, this is a risk adjusted to market. So if you were to, what you should be doing if you're going to comp uh, compare projected trends to actual trends without making membership adjustments, there would have to be some sort of a risk adjustment normalization, um, which is really challenging to untangle the medical impact of pharmacy, uh, medical versus pharmacy impact on risk adjustment. So a recommended approach that I would say would be a better comparison for apples to apples to eliminate that risk adjustment uncertainty would be to take um, enrolled members at the time that you projected your rates to enrolled members um, actual trends so that you could compare the projected trend to the uh, actual trends on the same membership base. So they didn't account for population changes, is that correct? That's correct. And did they consider the healthier population uh, we may have attracted in any particular year? It doesn't appear that was addressed. And are the trends that we provide that are provided by the PBM calculated based on a static population at the time the trends are produced? Yeah, the, the assumption implicit in the trends provided to us by our PBM um, is assuming that the membership that we have as of the most recent time period will, will persist into the future. And looking at that table and the years involved, uh, MVP's uh, market share has grown from 10% in 2016 to around 50% in 2020. Is that fair? That that sounds about right. And MVP's risk adjustment payment as a percentage of premium has also increased over time? Yes, uh, especially early on as we were growing. OK, thank you, Matt. Let's go back to the next bullet. If you go to page 20, just so the board can follow us. The third bullet is remove COVID booster, COVID-19 booster costs. Do you see that? I do. And you see the difference there is a, a decrease of 0.3%? Yes. Uh, so let's talk about the booster shots. Uh, since MVP's original filing in May, and since the June 25th interrogatory response, that we submitted on this issue. What are the CDC and FDA currently saying about the need for booster shots? The uh, yeah, the CDC and FDA recently come out and made the statement, uh, joint statement, saying that at this time um, there is no evidence that a booster shot will be needed. But they did not at all say that it won't ever be needed. They they're just saying that at this time, um, which is only a few months post vaccination really taking off and that and that's a direct quote at this time correct that's correct and if you go to exhibit 10 please exhibit 10 which uh could you please read the the title just to ensure i'm on the right one sure. Gary? it's the uh june 25th 2021 mvp individual group response letter number five thank you Okay, I'm there. Okay, and this was our response uh, on the booster issue back in June, June 25th. If you go to the second page, uh, there's a couple of references to some ph pharmaceutical com companies. I see Moderna and Pfizer. Do you see that? Yes. So what are Moderna and Pfizer doing uh, as it relates to booster shots? They're developing, they're researching and developing booster shots, um, and they're anticipating that they would have a booster shot available by this fall. And are they planning to seek FDA uh, authorization? 
emergency use authorization. Yes, that's my understanding. And since the uh, statement, the joint statement where uh, the CDC and the FDA said, you know, American, Americans who are fully vaccinated don't need a booster at this time. Since that statement, uh, are you aware of Moderna or Pfizer stopping uh, their efforts to work on the booster? I am not. Now, aren't these two companies uh, ones that developed the vaccine, the COVID vaccine last year? Yes, they did. And they did that in a matter of months rather than years, didn't they? Yeah, that's correct. I think uh, Senator Portman over the weekend, you probably didn't see it, he called it a miracle. Uh, would you agree that what they did was was extraordinary? Yes, I would. Yeah, it was. Uh, and it's it's great that it happened that fast. For, for all of us. Uh, is it actuarially sound to include this cost in the rate filing, in your opinion? It is because our objective is to align costs with our, our premiums with our costs. Um, I, I know it's saying at this time, uh, the CDC and FDA are saying at this time, they don't see the need for a booster shot, but you know we're preparing for 2022 rates. By then there may be some uh, reduction to immunity levels and you know it, there's also all this news coming out lately of the delta variant and uh, new variants that are hitting so in our opinion we should be including these costs because we do expect them to ultimately be utilized in 2022. are you familiar with the actual actuarial standard of practice 26 section 2.1 that defines actuarial soundness yes and is actual soundness defined to include that the rates, quote, are adequate to provide for all expected costs, end quote? Yes. And is this, in your opinion, the COVID booster an expected cost? Based on the data available, uh, you know, uh, we believe that it will be approved and will be utilized, or it will be at least approved for emergency use authorization. And last year, did MVP include the cost of the new anticipated COVID vaccine in its proposed rate filing? Last we did. Year? We did. And that was based on similar reports from the pharmaceutical companies, correct? Correct. It was based on the data available at the time that we had. And was MVP right? Yes. And respectfully, the board disagreed with us last year on, on the vaccinations. Uh, being uh, uh, paid for as part of the rate filing, correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Matt. Okay, let's go to- Sorry to interruption, um, Mr. Chair, I just want to uh, confirm that we didn't lose Mr. Angoff. We don't have his picture anymore, so I just want to make sure that he's still part of the proceeding. Yeah, I see his um, bubble. Uh, Mr. Angoff, could you- Take yourself off mute and just confirm that you are with us still. Looks like he might have stepped away for a second. Would you like me to uh, continue? Is other HCA council online? Happy to okay, wait. Are there any objection to? Uh, continuing to keep the flow here. Uh, I think that's fine, hearing Mr. Hearing Officer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Matt, if you please go back to Exhibit 17 and page 20. Just want to uh, keep going with our roadmap. We're up to bullet number four which is a use of a COVID-19 adjustment. Um, so let's go to page 12 of the exhibit. So the board can follow us. Let me know when you're there, Matt. I'm there. And see at the bottom, it says COVID-19 impact. There's a heading. And yes. so page 12, then going into page 13, there's a discussion about it 
on the bottom of 12 into page 13. Do you see that? Yes. So would you please explain what LNE is doing here in terms of considering 2020 claims? Yes, again, the, the LNE is using the URT to develop adjustments off of our proposed rates. Um, and because they're modifying our trend, part of because we use 2019 data, part of the URT instructions is that you're you're supposed to align your projected claim costs with the market adjusted index rate, which is basically your projected claims, allowed claims, which would be um, MVP's expense plus member cost share net of risk adjustment. Um, because MVP used 2019 data uh, to set our rates, we the COVID the COVID-19 impact of 6.5% that LNE is referencing is basically a normalization factor to take um, the URT from a 2020 basis or from our rates from a 2019 basis to the 2020 URT basis. And because LNE is recommending, so to go back to the bullet, to tie this into the bullet where they're recommending a reduction to this factor, the reduction is driven by the fact that um, in the URT, LNE is recommending a change to the pharmacy trend. When that happens, it reduces, it has a downstream impact. Okay. Would you please go to page five of the exhibit, exhibit 17? And at the bottom of page five, there's a heading 2020 actual slash projected claims experience. Do you see that? Yes. Would you please read the first two sentences and then this goes on to page six and uh, the referenced footnote. You don't need to read the whole footnote, just the beginning of it, please. So the first two sentences or read the first three? Just want to clarify. Um, first two, please. OK, actual 2020 claims experience for the individual and small group markets was approximately 3.3 percent lower than the 2020 costs expected at the time of the 2021 rate filing. One major driver of this outcome is decreased utilization related to the COVID-19 pandemic. You caught me in a mat there. Please read the third sentence too. <laughs> <laughs> While actual 2020 experience has varied across the nation by carrier, declines have typically ranged between 4% and 16%. And then there's a footnote to a Kaiser Family Foundation article, correct? Correct. So would you explain any concerns you have about this range that's referenced? Explain what it is and then explain concerns. The Kaiser Family Foundation um, did a comparison of historical profit margins by uh, across the country to estimate, they're using that as a proxy, those comparisons as a proxy um, for the impact of COVID-19 on claims in 2020. That's a reasonable calculation, but as you can see, the range is about 12%. It's from 4% to 16%. So carrier by carrier, um, it, you know, we can, we're seeing much different outcomes. And it's worth noting that this is an approximation being used as a proxy for overall impact. Again, the, there's different changes by in each state, not every state that I'm aware of, had all of the state of emergency impacts that the state of Vermont had. So us having to lax uh, prior authorization as a carrier is having it was is having an impact on the way that we can help control costs. Um, COVID lab testing has been very high. You know, those are also skewing claims. So it, it doesn't seem like it's a perfect calculation, but it does provide a reasonable approximation with a wide range of 12 percent. And then if you go back to page excuse five, me, that first, excuse me, Mr. Hearing Officer, I, I just want to, uh, Mike Fisher here, I just want to let you know that I've been, oh, maybe Jay is back from his technical difficulties. Never mind. My, my profuse apologies. I, I can now hear and see, and I heard everything that was going on before. Great. Thank you. Okay, Matt, uh, you talked about the wide range and having uh, concerns about the wide range. Uh, then if you go back to page five, that first sentence you read, what is LNE doing in terms of pinpointing 
And do you have a concern about that? Yeah, L and E is coming up with an a uh, an impact of three point three percent. Again, it's because of all those moving parts. We don't see the we don't see why you would choose to try to come up with a single figure when there's such a wide range that could be impacting could be impacting 2020. Our our projection using 2019 data eliminates all those concerns. Um, so it doesn't it just doesn't make sense to us why you would add this complex high variance assumption to to develop a rate recommendation. In fact, um, you know as as everybody's aware, MVP operates in New York as well as Vermont. Uh, the New York regulators actually dictated that every carrier in New York State has to use 2019 data to set our small group individual rates to eliminate the noise that's being seen in 2020. Um, they basically said to, to keep the market from massive amounts of potential disruptions and up and downs and rate increases, we'd prefer that everybody, we, we're, we're telling you, you have to use 2019 data, ignore 2020 data. So by using 2019 data, you avoid this problem of the wide range of possible results and picking a pinpoint uh, within that range, correct? That's correct. And you mentioned uh, the, the New York State uh, regulators. That was the Department of Financial Service? That's correct. And do you know uh, whether they made an inquiry uh, to the various carriers uh, on what what the carriers felt would be the better data point. Yeah, they they solicited feedback from carriers throughout the state. Um, and it, although I didn't see every carriers, not every carrier voiced their opinion vocally on a on a team's call. Um, it was nobody, no no carrier, no actuaries had an issue with using 2019 data. It was all it was preferred pretty much across the board. And order of magnitude, is it, we, you know, we're a little Vermont, we don't have as many carriers. How many carriers are we talking about? Just order of magnitude. Um, probably in the range of 10. Okay, thank you. Plus or minus four or five. Thank you. <clears throat> that was answered like an actuary. That was very good. <laughs> uh, were you surprised that l &E adjusted from MVP's use of the 2019 data to it using uh, 2020 data in its actuarial memorandum? Yes. Um, I mean, at this time last year, we were already thinking about what are we going to do for 2022 rate filings because we're sitting here in the middle of a pandemic. There's all these differences. We know 2020 data is going to be really skewed, and it's we know how challenging it is to isolate all those different moving parts and then come up with a single point estimate. So um, in February, I reached out to l and &E to ask them if they were going to dictate the experience period to use or if they would accept us, you know, choosing uh, 2019 or 2020. They told us that it was OK as long as we just uh, provide an explanation of why we were choosing the ma making the decision we were making. And that was a communication with with Ms. Lee. That's correct. Uh, Ms. Lombardo, you were asked in an interrogatory, what if MVP had used its 2020 experience period instead of 2019? You indicated that MVP would have then used a normalization factor to undo the reduction in cost due to COVID-19. <laughs> so my, my question is, why didn't you do that then? Why did you just use the 2019 data? If we were to... If you know, if if L and E or the board dictated that we use 2020 data to set our rates, we would have essentially run our rate filing in parallel using 2019 data and 2020 data, come up with our rates using 2019 data and backed into a normalization factor. It was that is a much cleaner approach, in my opinion, uh, to come up with a single point estimate rather than trying to isolate the impact of potentially risk adjustment anomalies, suppressed utilization, COVID lab testing. Uh, impact of prior off, potentially pent up demand that was hitting later in the second half of 2020. All those items made 2020 really challenging to come up with a point estimate. So our decision was use 2019. And if we were dictated to use 2020, we would have essentially just backed into what the factor was. Thank you. Okay, Matt, let's go back to our roadmap, please. Go to page 20. These are our bullets. And there's a fifth bullet 
risk adjustment transfers. Let me know when you're there. I'm there. And that's a, that's the 0.4% increase that we talked about at the opening of your testimony, correct? Correct. So if the board agrees with uh, MVP and throws out LA, L&E's use of 2020 data, uh, how would that impact their suggested increase of risk assumption? They would, yeah, they would change the risk adjustment time period to match with the experience period. Um, because of those changes, we would have an approximate increase of 0.4%. Again, the, the intent of risk adjustment is to normalize for market morbidity risk. So suppose MVP enrolls only healthy individuals and the competitors enroll all sick individuals. Our claims will come through lower than our competitors, even if we had the exact same uh, unit costs uh, and contracted discounts with hospitals, same exact um, utilization management programs in place. Risk adjustment then brings those two together. So you're competing on apples to apples playing field, on a level playing field. So if 2019 claims were used to set rates, but 2020 risk adjustment were utilized to normalize those rates, that wouldn't make sense because you'd be have an apples and oranges comparison. Um, so l and &E is just saying, if we're going to use 2020 data, which is you know implicitly being used by them because they're using the URT to come up with adjustments, we should be normalizing for risk adjustment, 2020 risk adjustment. We do agree that if the URT is being used to set our rates, that 2020 risk adjustment should be used. We just fundamentally disagree with using the URT and 2020 data to set our rates. So if the board agreed with l and &E, then uh, we would agree to the 0.4 increase, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Thank you. The next bullet, the seventh bullet, oh, excuse me, bullet six we agree to, so okay. bullet correct? That's correct. Okay, so let's move to the last bullet. That's reflect impact of American Rescue Plan Act on claims. Do you see that? Yes. And they've indicated this represents a merged market impact of 0.1%, uh, percent, correct? That's correct. So it's a decrease of 2% in individual rates due to expected morbidity improvements. That's their opinion, correct? Um, they 0.2%, I believe you said 2%, so just to make it clear. Yes, thank you very much. But for the board's purposes, the merged impact here we're talking about, this is a 0.1%, correct? Correct. <coughs> Please go to page 10 of exhibit 17. And at the bottom of the page, let me know when you're there. We're there. There's an American Rescue Plan Act heading, and then there's a discussion about the act that goes into page 11. Do you see that? Yes. So I want to kind of walk through this and ask you some questions. What are l &E's presumptions regarding uninsured people that will be enrolled? Uh, l and &E is assuming that the new individuals enrolling um, if they are to enroll, will be healthier than the current population. And do you take issue with that presumption? Yes, I mean, we, we did review the Vermont um, Household Insurance Survey, and it is true that the population that's uninsured does appear to be a younger population than the average um, enrollees in the individual market. Our issue is with the fact that we're not sure how many people are actually going to um, enroll is one thing. And then another item is these are members that, you know, presumptive, uh, you know, our assumption is they have not had care delivered to them in recent years. They may have some high morbidity conditions uncovered that were going untreated. And that's great because then they can get them treated, but that doesn't necessarily translate to uh, a healthier population. Given the number of members that l &E is projecting will enroll, it would only take a couple of those, you know, higher cost members to basically wipe out the impact of that downward adjustment. Thank you. To that point, go to page 11, the fourth paragraph. Let me know <laughs> when you're there. Okay. Read the last uh, sentence in that paragraph, please. 
LNE assumes that this new population will be 10% healthier than the currently covered population. Man, I got a little lost. I apologize. Page 11. There's a, it's the, it's the third full paragraph starting LNE notes. Do you see okay. that? Yep. Would you read LNE notes? That LNE notes that the uninsured population with incomes just above 400% FPL will see a 40% reduction in premium, while the premium reduction becomes smaller as income, in, as income increases. Based on this change in premium, LNE believes that approximately 800 new members will enroll. Eight hundred. That's a pretty precise number, although they say approximately, right? Correct. Is that a safe presumption in your view? Um, it's an assumption. Actuaries make assumptions. Um, it's. I don't. I don't know the detail behind how they arrived at that figure, though. Okay. Um, the second paragraph on page eleven. <laughs> this is where Elni summarizes MVP's views uh, on this issue. Correct. The second full paragraph, yes. Thank you. And uh, basically, MVP does not assume any change in morbidity, correct? Correct. Why is that? It's it's an unknown. Um, it's a wide unknown. So because of the items that I, I was referencing before, whether or not, um, you know, the, the people that are going to enroll, if they do choose to enroll, some members just elect not to have coverage. We saw a steady state of approximately 2% weren't uh, of Vermonters weren't purchasing coverage or weren't enrolling, even if they're eligible for a Medicaid program. Um, so it's unknown why these people aren't enrolling. Some of it is could be cost. Some of it could just be that they fundamentally don't want to go through the mechanism or have insurance. They don't believe in it for some reason. Um, so it's just a, it's just an unknown and um, it's something that we felt there was a wide range of outcomes it wasn't very predictable at this point in time so we chose to not make an adjustment thank you so let's go to the fifth paragraph which is starts out it is expected that you see that paragraph yes read it please it is expected that this uninsured population has not purchased coverage to date either due to good health or due to the high cost of premiums Eleni assumes that this new population will be 10% healthier than the currently covered population. So it says 10%, right? Yes. Why not 9% or 13%? Do you know? I don't know. Does Eleni cite any studies of the health of Vermonters or other Vermont health data in their uh, opinion here? They do not. Aren't actuaries supposed to rely on data rather than their own assumptions about the health of Vermonters? In the yeah, to the best of our ability, we try to use data that's available to us uh, to estimate to to make our assumptions. Thank For you. example, in our our COVID booster shot assumption, we leverage flu vaccine utilization as a proxy for it and cost because. Um, our assumption was if people are going to prevent, try to prevent the flu, they're also going to choose to prevent COVID from, from hitting them. So, you know, we try to make assumptions that are grounded in some sort of data. Thank you. Okay, Matt, those, those were the issues in dispute. I want to touch on a couple of other issues if we could. Um, if you please go to exhibit 17, page 10. <clears throat> okay. And I want to talk about telehealth related costs. If you look at the sixth paragraph, there's a heading increase in telehealth utilization 0.3%. Let me know when you're there. I'm there. So M MVP is requesting a 0.3% increase as part of their rate filings uh, that would be related to telehealth utilization, correct? That's correct. And would you read the last sentence of that paragraph? Eleni considers this to be reasonable. Something we agree on, correct? That's correct. Good news. Okay. Now, uh, Matt, would you please explain uh, the telehealth increase? And I want to ask you about an exhibit we put in yesterday, but first just talk about the telehealth 
uh, increase generally? Yeah, prior to um, COVID and you know offices being shut down, we had negligible amounts of telehealth utilization in our data. At, in 2020, post pandemic, we ended up with a PMPM amount of approximately $17 in telehealth costs. Um, that wasn't if those were one to one replacements for in person visits, there wouldn't be an impact. But what we've what we know from you know some member information as well as um, our data is that there's actually been instances where prior to the pandemic, there weren't the, the claim wasn't being filed. A good example would be if you have a small child at home and you know they have a rash or something like that, you call your pediatrician and say, Hey, can you just give me peace of mind that this is okay? Um, and this isn't against pediatricians. This is kind of we've seen that this is just one specific example. Um, and in the past, they would just pick up the phone, call you back. The doctor on call would call you back, have a minute or two conversation, and you won't be charged. Now we're seeing instances where um, those those calls, those one to two minute calls, are actually being charged. Additionally, there's instances where somebody will call and say. I'd like to have, you know, uh, I, can you can you help me understand exactly, you know, what's going on with me? And if that if that uh, visit can't be handled through a through either audio or visual purposes uh, virtually, then the doctor is saying, okay, well, we need you to come in. So there's an additional visit that's associated with it. Those items are leading to um, this cost increase. Thank you. Now, uh, yesterday. Uh, the board asked and we stipulated to exhibit 28. Um, would you please go to that exhibit? OK, I'm there. Now, this is a DFR order, Department of Financial Regulation order dated June 29th, 2021, uh, relating to uh, audio only telephone service, correct? Correct. Um, and uh, had you seen, have you seen this particular order before yesterday? That was the first time that I personally had seen it. Others at MVP had seen it, um, but the, yesterday was the first time that I had seen it. Okay. So I'm going to ask you some questions, but uh, with the caveat that you might not have all the answers just yet to these questions because th this this came in uh, yesterday. Okay. So. If you go to page eight of the order, it's the very last page, and there's a section B. It's actually 3B. Carry okay. On. And let me read that to you. It says health insurance plans shall reimburse providers for audio only services at a rate no less than 75% of the rate for equivalent in person or audiovisual telemedicine covered service, period. Plans are strongly encouraged to negotiate rates with providers for audio only telephone services that reflect their clinical value. Did, did I read that right? Yes, you did. So so Matt, the, the issue here I think is, uh, what is MVP doing as a result of this order in terms of uh, charging, uh, uh, you know, paying 100% or paying 75% or something in between can you explain it, please, as you understand it? Yeah, so um, as I understand it, based on conversations we had a few months ago when we were trying to develop our assumptions for our rates, um, we were we were talking, we worked with our clinical team because we're trying to balance cost with clinical effectiveness. Um, that's kind of, so the clinical team is trying to figure out what is that right balance, and we're deferring to them to some extent um, to come up with the payment policy. And we we're also waiting for this guidance, which you know came out about 20 days ago, uh, to help inform how we would set our payment policy. I don't, my understanding and my knowledge is that it has not been finalized yet um, by MVP, but we have bantered around concepts such as um, reimbursing behavioral health, telehealth visits at 100% of in-person, and then reimbursing other visits at a lower reimbursement rate trying to balance, you know, trying to strike that proper balance of clinical effectiveness and quality versus cost. So at the time that we set our rates, we didn't have any information other than the data that was, we didn't have DFR's guidance. 
Um, so we were just using our data post pandemic compared to our uh, pre pandemic data to derive that adjustment. So our assumption is assuming um, the, the, the state of emergency reimbursement for telehealth. That would be at 100 percent. Yes. Okay. And then if I understood your testimony, you're not sure you well, let me ask you, did you reached out yesterday to try to get clarification on this, correct? Okay. That's correct. So it may be something if the board has questions, we can we can get the answer. But as it stands now, your general understanding is as to mental health, and would that be substance abuse too? Yes. There'd be 100 percent reimbursement. And then for non-behavioral, it would be somewhere uh, less than that between 75 and 100, but you really don't know. Is that correct? That's correct. And, you know, the 100 percent is in set in stone. I, that was, you know, the last time I heard about this, which was a couple of months ago um, when we were setting our rates, that was where the, you know, our clinical team's brains were kind of situated. I don't know if they've changed that opinion since then. We would have to follow up with them for, more formally. And uh, material impact on the rate, the 0.3 percent. Can you give the board any sense? Um, you know, I think that's I think that's all relative. Um, 0.3 percent is, if I look at that, we build 1.5 percent profit into our rates. So 0.3 percent is approximately 20 percent of our entire profit margin, right? If that's not accounted for, our job is actuaries. You know, as you referenced earlier, ASAP 26 is to align premiums with total costs. So that's that's what we're trying to do with this adjustment. So, so fair enough. So let me ask it a different way. Um, you can't say whether what we just described in the 75 percent versus 100 percent once that policy is in place. As you sit here today, you can't tell the board whether that would change that 0.3 number in any way, correct? That's correct. Um, what I can say is that a large portion of our shift in services from in-person to virtual or in-person to telehealth was in that behavioral health um, bucket. That was, we kind of organized our data by behavioral health versus non-behavioral health for this analysis. And when you saw the increase in, you know, the overall change in costs, it was primarily driven by behavioral health utilization. Thank you. Uh, next, Matt, I want to shift gears and ask you, and you heard uh, uh, Attorney Angoff's opening, and he kind of touched on this. Uh, and that's accounting for administrative expenses from year to year. I want to ask you about that generally, OK? So first, I think I'd ask you to go to Exhibit 17 again, page 15. OK. And there's a heading number 10 in the middle of the page. It says changes in administrative costs. Do you see that? Yes. And this is l and E's discussion of MVP's administrative costs, correct? That's correct. And would you read the last sentence in section number 10? l and E considers the assumed 2022 administrative costs to be reasonable and appropriate. Thank you. So l and E. This year we're in agreement on our administrative costs, correct? That's correct. So let, let me go back to this general question. If MVP's administrative expenses for any year end up being more than what was estimated and approved in a rate filing, is it actuarially sound that, it, that the additional amount MVP had to spend no, excuse me. Is it actually sound to consider that additional amount that MVP had to spend and simply raise your rates next year to pay MVP back for the additional spend? Uh, well, it would depend on what our projected future costs are. Uh, so in general, it would not be unless it's a known item that you'd have to adjust for in the future. Similarly, if MVP's actuarial, excuse me, actual administrative expenses come in lower come in lower than what was estimated and approved in a given year, is it actually sound to simply fold those savings into your consideration of the rate filing in the next year? It goes, it's a two way street. Um, if we expect those costs to persist, then we should be adjusting. But if we, if we, there's a known change in our administrative cost structure, um, then we should make an adjustment to account for that. 
When setting premium rates, is your task to align and pay for the projected cost of services for the rate filing year, in this case for 2022? Yes. And align those with the administrative expenses for 2022. Is that correct? That's correct. Now I want to pivot to hospital budgets. That was item one in the recommendations this year from L&E on page 20. Okay, I'm there. So I think you've, you've testified before that generally we're in agreement with l and &E on approach as the information comes in, correct? Correct. If you would go to exhibit one, which is our rate filing for individual. And go to page 14, please. OK. So there's a heading just if you need to refer to this MVP trend factors. Uh, would you tell the board what assumptions MVP made about hospital budgets this year? Yes, for uh, 2022, we assume that the approved 2021 hospital budgets would be applicable in 2022. Okay. And then as you testified, you received all the uh, proposed budgets. Uh, in recent time and have reviewed those uh, and done some calculations, correct? Yes, that's correct. And uh, did that cause you to make any material change in the uh, requested increases this year? It was approximate. It wasn't it wasn't a very large change by any means. It was um, when you blend the two markets, it was less than a tenth of a percent. Less than a tenth of a percent, correct? That's correct. OK, if you go back to exhibit 17, page seven, please. OK. And uh, this page includes a hospital budget review discussion by uh, l e correct? Correct. And would you read the fifth paragraph that starts l e believes? l e believes utilizing recent hospital budget figures for the assumed unit cost trends is reasonable and appropriate. Once 2022 hospital budget requests are submitted, l e recommends that this new information be considered. And uh, MVP has done exactly that, right? You've considered the new information? Yes. Uh, the next heading is medical utilization trend. You see that above the sixth, pa sixth paragraph? Yes. And would you read the last sentence on the page, please, under that heading? Based on the above analyses, l &E considers the assumed utilization trend of 1% to be reasonable and appropriate. Thank you. Uh, to summarize your opinion, Matt, are MVP's 2022 proposed rates for individuals of 17.03% and small groups of 4.97% with or without this 0 0.0 to 0 0.1 adjustment you testified to for hospital budgets? That's approved by the board. It, are those rates uh, as filed with that potential adjustment actually sound and reasonable? Yes. And I want to ask you about reserves and solvency. Uh, what is MVP's proposed contribution to reserves this year? 1.5 percent. Okay. And would you go to Exhibit 18, please? That's the small group, uh, Gary. Just that want to be sure. Yes, that's the small group. Thank you. So Matt, exhibits 18 and then 19 behind it. These are the DF 
CFR solvency letters for small group and individual group respectively, correct? That's correct. And you've read them and are familiar with them, right? Yes. And are the letters identical in substance with the exception of 18 references to small group and 19 reference to the individual? Yes. So let's go to exhibit 18 and read under the heading summary of opinion at the top of the second page. Please read, read that. The proposed rate filed by MVPHP would not negatively impact its solvency and the company otherwise meets Vermont's financial licensing requirements for a foreign insurer. Would you agree with that statement? Yes. Assuming that our rates are actually sound, yes. And uh, are our proposed rates actually sound? Yes. On that page number two, if you would please read the third bullet under MBPHP solvency opinion, please. Finally, in 2020, all of MVP holding companies' operations in Vermont accounted for approximately 7% of its total premiums written. DFR has determined that MVPHP's Vermont operations pose little risk to its solvency. Nonetheless, adequacy of rates and contribution to surplus are necessary for all health insurers to maintain strength of capital that keeps pace with claim trends. Do you agree with that statement in the third bullet on page two? Yes, um, we have to meet statutory reserve requirements. Failing to meet those statutory reserve requirements could disrupt the market um, and not provide members with peace of mind. Um, it could lead to carriers going insolvent. Okay, and then go to the third page, please, of the exhibit. And please read under the heading impact of the filing on solvency. Based on the entity wide assessment above and contingent upon GMCB actuaries finding that the proposed rate is not inadequate, DFR's opinion is that the proposed rate will not have a negative impact on MVPHP solvency. And you agree with that statement? I do. And that would relate to both exhibit 18 and 19, correct? Correct. If you go back to LME's report, which is exhibit 17, and go to page 16, let me know when you're there. So exhibit 17, page 16. Okay, I'm there. Okay, so there's an item 12, change in contribution to reserves at the top. Do you see that? Yes. And under, in that section, would you please uh, read the first sentence in the fourth paragraph? Starting, Eleni believes. Yep. Eleni believes the CTR and bad debt assumptions are reasonable and appropriate. So Eleni agrees with us on our CTR of 1.5 this year. Yes. And then in this section, there's a second paragraph that makes a reference to it as a reasonableness check. Do you see that? Yes. And this is something that Eleni has done, I think, in the last couple of years. Uh, correct. Correct. So can you tell the board what the uh, what Eleni is doing here? Eleni is scanning uh, publicly available information, other QHP filings, to um, to evaluate. They're basically ranking every QHP filing available by year from uh, based on contribution to reserve from lowest to highest. What they're finding is that um, MVP every year is somewhere between the 70th and 82nd percentile, meaning sorry, we're between the 18th and 30th percentile, um, meaning that we're at, you know, kind of a, an outlier on the lower end of the range. Uh, said another way, 70 to 82% of carriers are proposing a CTR that exceeds the 1.5% that MVP is proposing. Thank you. And just to drill down a little bit on that. So in 2021, uh, it was 70%, correct? Correct. And in 2022, it was over 80% of the filings had assumed a CTR is higher than 
In 2020, it was 80%. In 2019, it was 82%. Thank you. So what if the CTR were 0.5? So rather than 1.5, it were 0.5, like the board reduced our CTR last year. What would happen uh, to those percentages generally? Uh, we'd become an even further outlier towards the bottom end of the range. In your opinion, will the MVP filed rates adversely impact the solvency of MVP Healthcare Inc? <clears throat> the proposed rates will not. You anticipate that the contributions to reserves would require a change based on the hospital budget proposals that we've discussed and your range of possibly a zero to 0.1 percent adjustment. Uh, those changes won't impact uh, CTR. Thank you. Uh, Matt, I want to uh, shift somewhat briefly to the non-actuarial issues. Uh, would you go to your pre-filed testimony, which is Exhibit 16? Okay. And this year, similar to last year, we've addressed, uh, at least in part, uh, non actual issues in the pre filed testimony, correct? Correct. So would you go to page six, please? Let me know when you're there. Sorry, my exhibits are actually, this is where my exhibits got crossed up. So just bear with me. Okay, I'm there. Great. And would you go to question 19, please, which is on page six? OK, I'm there. Terrific. I'm going to read the question to you. What steps has MVP taken to lower costs and establish that its proposed rates promote affordability, access to care, and quality of care for Vermonters? See that question? Yes. And the response lists uh, 16 items going into page 8, correct? Correct. And some of those items have uh, Addif additional cross references to other responses that flesh out the response. Is that fair? That's fair. Would these items, as well as your testimony today and all the other filings, evidence some of MVP's steps to lower costs, promote quality of care and access, and establish that the rates proposed are affordable to Vermonters? I agree with that. In your opinion, will short term underpricing? make insurance affordable in the long run? It will not. OK, Matt, so each year we need to go through the statutory criteria. I'm going to do that now. Um, and I want to preface it with this. Uh, we're talking about both filings, both the individual <clears throat> small group when I ask you these questions. And uh, the individual small group is 4.97. Uh, and the uh, Strike, strike all that. Let me say it differently. The the rate for an individual is seventeen point oh three, and the rate for the small group is four point nine seven. Correct. Correct. And then, with a possible uh, reduction in the range of zero to point one percent for hospital budgets. So all these questions I'm going to ask you will have that frame. Does that make sense to you? Yes, that makes sense. Do the MVP rates meet the standard of affordability based on rate, the rate filing, other evidence, and your testimony today? Yes, they do. Do the rates promote quality of care and access to health care based on the rate filing, other evidence, and your testimony today? They do. Is the rate filing unjust, unfair, inequitable, misleading, or contrary <laughs> to law on the rate filing, other evidence, and your testimony today? They are not. Are the rates reasonable based on the data that we have? Yes. Are the rates actuarially sound and fairly charging premium for services covered? They are. 
Are the rates excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory? They are not. Are the rates reasonable relative to the benefits that are offered? They are. Do they provide for payment of claims, administrative expenses, taxes, and regulatory fees, and have reasonable contingency or profit margins? They do. So they are adequate? That's correct, they are. Do the rates exceed the rate needed to provide for payment of claims, administrative expenses, taxes, regulatory fees, and reasonable contingency and profit margins? They do not. So they're not excessive? Correct. Do the rates result in premium differences among insureds within similar risk categories, which are not permissible under applicable law and do not reasonably correspond to differences in expected costs? They do. Uh, I think my double negatives might have confused you, or maybe I'm just confused, but let me try that again. Do the rates result in premium differences among insureds within similar risk categories, which are not permissible under applicable law and do not reasonably correspond to differences in expected costs? They're in compliance with the law and they do not. Thank you. Uh, so your earlier uh, response was an error, correct? Yes, it was. So they're not unfairly discriminatory, correct? That's correct. Would you agree with me that the statutory criteria we just went through are interrelated? Yes. They are not siloed. That's correct. Any adjustments to a rate increase for whatever reason all feed into the final number? Yes, that's correct. I agree. It's important that the final number is actuarially sound and reasonable correct? Correct. In this case, 17.03 for individual and 4.97 for small group, correct? Correct. If the board cuts the final number on non-actuarial grounds, is there a risk that the rate would no longer be adequate? There is. In contrast, based on your testimony and the other evidence, the insurance, the insurance products is affordable with a 17.03 for individual group and 4.97 for small group increase and meets all the statutory criteria, correct? Correct. Thank you. That's all the questions I have for this witness at this time. There might be a rebuttal later in the day. Thank you. So I think now's a, a good time to take a 10 minute break. Um, unless someone feels we need to press on, I think a break is appropriate and then we'll um, reconvene at uh, 12 after and uh, start with cross and then move on to board questions and board members so that you are uh, thinking ahead. I'm going to start with member Yusufer, then move to member Lunge, member Holmes, member Pelham and the chair. So why don't we uh, reconvene at 12 or 13 after now? Does that sound good? All right, I can see everyone's here except for uh, board member Pelham. Tom, are you with us? I'm here. Are you having internet problems or? No. OK. No. Good deal. All right, since it looks like we're all here, why don't we uh, go ahead and go back on the record in the matter of MVP Health Plan Inc's 2022 individual and small group rate filings. Uh, we left off um, with Gary finishing up direct examination of Matt Lombardo and I'll turn it over to you, Jay. Do you have questions for Mr. Lombardo? Yes, I do. Thank you very much, Mr. Hearing Officer. And I apologize to you and to everyone for the interruption that I caused when I was off screen. You might enjoy the reason. I pressed a button on my computer by mistake, which rotated everyone 90 degrees. So I was thinking about, I was trying to see if I could possibly actually conduct an examination like that and concluded that I couldn't. And the only reason I could fix it is that I, my daughter happens to be home. And so she came up and fixed it. So that's the explanation. And again, I apologize. Uh, with that introduction, good morning, Mr. Lombardo. 
Um, you are a fellow of the casualty, I'm sorry, a fellow of the Society of Actuaries, right? That's correct. Okay, and so the, the, the person that prepared the, uh, the the rate filing is Chris Pontiff? Uh, with, yes, that's, he signed the documents. Uh, he reports to me, and I had oversight on the preparation of the rate filing. Okay, so you supervise him? Yes. Okay, and so you would agree with me then it's fair for me to ask you any question about the rate filing that I would ask uh, Mr. Pontiff? That's correct. Okay, and do you supervise all the actuaries that prepare rate filings? Uh, commercial rate filings, yes, but I don't have oversight over our Medicare business. Okay, but this, this is personalized, right? This isn't commercial, is it? This is commercial. Uh, so this is commercial business, but we bucket small group, individual, large group as all commercial business. Um, Medicare is separate. I guess um, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about preparing the rate filing. When you sit down to prepare a rate filing or supervise the person that is preparing the rate filing, do you go back and look at the last year's rate filing and ask, ask uh, you know, what we got right, what we got wrong in that filing? On a high level, uh, yes, but not every exact piece of detail. What we're doing is trying to set our rates based on the data available to us today and see and set our rates for the future year. Okay. So if it turns out that under the prior year's rate filing, you took in more than you had projected that you would, that you would take in, um, what, if anything, happens to that difference between what you projected you would take in and what you actually took in. What we're trying to do is set an actuarially sound rate, which is to project the claims for the upcoming year or the projection period, um, and then we would make adjustments as needed. If what happened in 2020 was something that would persist in perpetuity, then there would be an adjustment made that would reflect that. Um, but, you know, the same goes both ways. If, if rates are, if claims exceed rates, then we don't make adjustments to make up for those losses either, uh, unless it's something that we expect to persist into the future. I understand that. Let me ask it this way. To, to what extent, if any, is the difference between the amount that you projected you would make in 2020 in the 2021 rate filing and the amount that you actually made reflected in this current rate filing? It's not reflected because we don't expect the outlier year that was 2020 to persist into 2022. And right now, when we look at our 2021 emerging data, we're seeing the exact opposite of what happened in 2020. We're eight to 10% behind our target run rate. And if that's a one-time event, we don't expect to have to pass that through into future rates. Um, it's really just a matter of using the data available, understanding it to the extent it's possible, making adjustments or not making adjustments by ignoring 2020 data, and then projecting future costs to be aligned with premiums. Did you calculate a rate of return on premium for the, uh, in connection with your 2020-21 individual rate filing? The 2020 or 2021? The, the, the filing you made last year for your 2020-21, for your, the filing you made in 2020 for your 2021 rates. We projected uh, in 2021, we, we built in 1.5% profit margin, um, and I believe that the board approved a 0.5% uh, contribution to reserves. I don't think that answers my question. Did you calculate a rate of return on premium in connection with your... I guess I'm not, it's not clear. Uh, Can you define what you mean by rate of return? I, I, I thought you were asking me for contribution to reserves. No, I was asking you for a, a rate of return on premium. Did you calculate a rate of return on premium? I, I guess I, it's hard for me to answer that question because it's not clear what you're asking me. Um, we built in a 1.5% profit, profit margin or contribution to reserves to meet uh, solvency requirements. That is the return that we expected to receive on our premiums. Well, as an actuary, you, you've calculated what rates of return on premium before, haven't you? I guess I would just say actual actual contribution to reserves versus projected. Yes. Well, are, are you telling the board that a contribution to reserves is the same thing as return on premium? 
the way that you defined return on premium, I would it seems consistent to me. Well, how would you define return on premium? Uh, the expected, the expected excess of, the, basically, if I were to take profit margin or operating income as the way that I would hear it. It's the percentage of premium that we expect to be returned to the organization for solvency purposes. The percentage of premium you expect to re be returned for solvency purposes, but that's not the total return on premium, is it? Well, one is actual and one is projected. I think that's the nuance that we're getting at. Okay. When you select a value for a component of the rate filing, are there actuarial standards which uh, which tell you how to go about selecting that value? Uh, there's data, you know, there's there's guidance on how do you data quality. Um, and at the end of the day, the key is that you're supposed to make assumptions that are projecting to future costs. So you take your historical data, you use the data available to you, and that is how you arrive at your projected assumption. And so are there actuarial standards that tell you how to uh, arrive at a particular value based on the data that you review? It's not prescribed as long as you are using reasonable and appropriate assumptions to the best of my knowledge. Okay, so there's not, there's rarely if ever one single correct answer, right? There are generally any anything, any future event that you're trying to predict, not just um, not just as an actuary, there's a range of potential outcomes. And we try to come up with our best estimate and we try to understand how wide of a range of potential outcomes there could be around those estimates. Could you please turn to exhibit 15? And Mr. Lombardo, I'll do my best not to switch back and forth between uh, different exhibits. I'm going to have to do it once or twice, but in general, I'll focus on a particular exhibit. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Are you there at exit 15? Uh, ex exit. Exhibit 15. I drive yeah, the uh, MVP response to the Green Mountain Care Board's first set of non-actuarial questions. Very good. Could you turn to page 004 on that? of that exhibit. OK. OK, and you, could you go down to row seven where it says preliminary medical loss ratio MLR? You see that? Yes. OK, and then could you read the number in column one under the heading individual? 1.056. OK, and what does that 1.056 mean? Uh, it means that for every dollar of premium that we collected in the individual New York market, uh, we spent 105.6% of that on claims. Okay. And now could you turn to page uh, 010 of that exhibit and look down on, uh, again, on row seven and read the read the number in the column one. 0 0.893, 0 0.893. Okay, and what does that number signify? That, that states that in the state of Vermont, for every dollar of premium collected in the individual market, we spend 89.3% of that dollar, 89.3 cents for every dollar premium on claim expense. Okay, so would you agree with me then that 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 the taking those two numbers together indicates that New Yorkers got about 16 cents more back on their premium dollar than Vermonters in 2020, correct? Uh, we we were very underpriced and unintentionally in New York, um, and we've made corrections for that. We when we set our rates, we set our rates based on the block of business to stand alone on its own. We're not trying to cross the two populations together. Um, again, we had very unexpected adverse experience in our New York block in 2020. I, I don't question that. I just want to make sure that the board understands and that I understand 
what these numbers signify. They do signify, don't they, that in 2020, New Yorkers got 16 cents more back on their premium dollar than Vermonters did, correct? MVP spent 16, 16 cents approximately more on claims in New York than we did for every premium dollar in New York individual than we did on Vermont individual. Okay, and you said in New, in New York, you were going to make corrections on that. Obviously, you can't make money if you spend, spend more than a dollar for each dollar you take in. How are you going to correct that? Uh, through an adjusted rate increase, making adjustments to our rates. Okay, and in New York, you're aware, aren't you, that MVP has asked for 17, an approximately a 17% rate increase in the individual market? Yes. Okay, and MVP also has asked for a 17% increase in the Vermont market, even though MVP only gave Vermonters 89 cents back on the dollar and gave New Yorkers a dollar five back on the dollar, correct? Yep, but that's that's ignoring changes to our product mix that we're offering in New York, uh, as well as items that we're doing to address that adverse experience. So, and it's also ignoring 2021 rate changes. Uh, 2021 rate changes, we're, we're not working off of 2020 data to de derive at a rate increase, we're working off of 2021 rating, premium rates. Okay. Um, could you turn to exhibit one, please? Okay. Okay. And you see the, uh, the the third paragraph down, beginning per ASOP number twenty six. Uh, I'm sorry. Which page? Oh, I'm on. Oh, sorry. Um, good point. Page uh, would be page eleven. Page three of the document. Page eleven in the exhibit. Okay. I'm there. Okay, so you see that third paragraph that starts per ASAP number 26? Yes. Okay, and um, one of the requirements of ASAP 26 is, isn't it, as stated there, is that the premium rate must uh, reflect investment income, correct? Yes. Okay, how, if at all, does your proposed rate for 2022 reflect investment income? We're not capturing uh, that specific item, but as claims are trending at a higher rate than um, we're returning investments, even if our investments are going up a couple of percent a year, um, then in claims are trending up at a higher rate, then that still will reduce your solvency as a percentage of, of total over the long run. Okay, that, that may well be, but you're not reflecting investment income in your rate filing, are you? Not explicitly, but our contribution to reserves is uh, when our financial planning, <clears throat> excuse me, and our accounting team comes up, uh, when they do their forecasting and modeling, they are taking all that into consideration. That that does help derive our 1.5% contribution to reserves. Okay. It's not explicit in the, explicitly called out in the refiling, but it is factored in behind the scenes uh, by our accounting and financial planning teams. Um, what is your, what, what is an IBNR factor? It's a reserve. So <clears throat> suppose I go to the doctor today, July 19th, 2021. That claim may not be paid. Um, it, it's not paid right on the day usually. There's a lag in the time that it takes to process claims. Uh, so the reserve or IBNR incurred but not reported is what that stands for. Incurred, it's a claim that's incurred but it hasn't yet been reported or yet paid. Um, that's a known outstanding item that impacts our income statement. We have to hold a liability for that, which is audited by third party actuaries at year end. So, they, so you've got paid data and then the idea <clears throat> is added to the paid data to, uh, to result in incurred data, right? Claims that were incurred in 2019 with run out through, you know, early 2021, plus a small IBNR factor represent our incurred data. Okay, so if you'll go to the last paragraph on uh, page 11, uh, you'll see there that you talk about using, in this case, in this rate filing, a negative IBNR factor. How can an IBNR factor be negative? 
It's because um, there's one, if you go to the following page, there's a claim on the follow, there, there's one line that has a 0.999 factor in there. Um, and what's happening is we pull data through a certain time period, but then because of the lag between when that time period existed and when the rate filing was due, we made adjustments as needed because we had more relevant information. So we have our incurred estimate for the 2019 experience period, which is about a month later than with the paid through date that our claims represented. So if I'm looking at that table, the paid claims represent a different time period than the incurred claims. Uh, so we're making an adjustment to represent our best estimate of our incurred claims for 2019 at that time. But it isn't the purpose of an IBNR, fra IBNR factor to estimate how much more is ultimately going to be paid than your paid data shows? Usually we use data with two to three months of run out, which results in an IBNR factor of a few percentage points, you know, given a range around that. We're using 2019 data, which at this point had 14 months of run out in it. So almost all the claims have been paid. So that one reversal of claim that we found out about in the month after we pulled our data, that's resulting in a reduction to the IBNR factor. Okay, so is it, so it, it would is have it, been. A, go sorry. ahead. No, you. I was going to say it would, it would have basically been a 1.0 IBNR factor, but we we chose to pass through the best estimate of uh, what our incurred claims were at the time of the filing. Which it, which resulted in a slight reduction. So the, the so the paid data you're using here, to which the IBNR factor is applied, is 14 months of 2019 data. It's 2019 data, and then it's run out through February of 2021, which is 14 months. That's the paid claims, and then the incurred estimate represents as of March 2021. Usually. In a normal year where there isn't COVID, we use the most recent calendar year of data, and then you only have two months or three months of run out. So you have to add 12 months to that. Okay, so, so if, you, if you were using 2020 data, you would expect that the IBNR factor would be positive. Yes. Okay. Um, could you turn please to page 13 <clears throat> of the exhibit one? Okay. I'm there. OK, and the, the bottom paragraph, line 18, adjustment for COVID-19 booster shots, you see that? Yes. OK, and we discussed earlier the different views on whether or not there's a booster shot will be needed, and I'm not going to go uh, go through any of that with you again. Um, but you uh, you estimate your cost of a <clears throat> COVID booster shot by looking at the cost of a flu booster shot, correct? That's correct. Okay, and my question is, why don't you estimate the cost of a COVID shot by looking at other, by looking at how much you paid for a COVID, what the cost was to MVP of a COVID shot? So the, uh, the federal government has, so essentially a two cycle dose of, of the COVID booster shots of Pfizer, Moderna in this case, is approximately $45. It's $22 and I believe 48 cents per dose. Um, so what's happening though, what we didn't know at the time when we were setting our rates last year was how much the government was gonna subsidize the purchasing of those vaccines. The $45 represents the cost of administering the shot. So uh, it's not actually the ingredient cost. If you think about it, there's two components to a vaccine cost. It's the cost of the actual vaccine itself, and then it's the cost of the administration, the pharmacist, the nurse, whoever it may be um, administering that vaccine. We don't know what the future holds in terms of funding uh, from the federal government for COVID booster shots. At some point, we would expect that to run out, and that's what we're implicitly assuming in our data. Okay, so, so last year, uh, the federal government <laughs> assumed the cost of a COVID shot, is that correct? The ingredient cost, not okay. the administrative cost of it. And that's not what you assumed in last year's rate filing. Last year's rate filing, we relied on um, a national consulting firm, Wakely. They did a study and they their estimate was uh, an approximation for the COVID vaccine would be the cost of Tamiflu. 
um, which we found was approximately $75 per dose. And that and that's the assumption that you included in your rate filing for la of last year, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, but you also made, didn't you, one terrific assumption that turned out to be right that I couldn't be happier about, and I believe everybody on this call couldn't be happier, happier about, right? I mean, it was approved and people are utilizing it. So yeah, I mean, I'm happy about that. So if that's what you're implying, yes. I, yes, I, I am. I'm implying that we all get some things right and some things wrong and you got that right. And I was skeptical and I'm so happy that you were right and I was wrong. Um, Thank you. Could you please turn to, this is the one time I'm gonna uh, ask you to do a little flipping. Could you go to ex exhibit four and uh, turn to page 004 on that exhibit. Okay, I'm there. Okay, and that's that. That's the same table that you were talking about earlier with council, wasn't it? Um. Yeah. That is. That's the. That's the table that Eleni placed into their opinion. Okay, and I just want to make sure that I understand the numbers and that the board understands the numbers here, starting from the the date that's farthest back, twenty uh, between twenty fifteen and twenty sixteen. Your uh, projection, your expected, was just about on the money, right? Just about two two tenths of a difference, two tenths of a percent difference. That's correct. Okay, but then for the next year, you your projection. Your, your, the actual was less than half what you expected, correct? Correct. Um, and then in the, for the next year, 2017 to 2018, again, the actual was less than half of what you expected, correct? Correct. Okay, and then for 2018 to 2019, the actual was what was approximately one third of what you expected, correct? Yep, just more than one third. Yep. Okay. And on the other hand, for 2019 to 2020, um, the actual was more than uh, three times what you expected, correct? That's correct. Okay, so when you have data like this, that obviously varies quite a bit and the differences vary quite a bit, um, there are various actual actuarial techniques you can use to arrive at a at a defensible assumption as to what trend would be in the next year, correct? It's challenging because of risk adjustment, which is what we reference in the paragraph above, especially given our growth and market share over that time period. Okay. Well, would it be reasonable to, to use the most recent year, the 21.7 percent? If that is expected to persist, then yes, um, especially because that does represent our membership as of, you know, it's the closest approximation for our membership that we have today. Okay, so then are you telling the board you expect that 21.7% to persist? In 2021 and 2022, we expect something more around the range of 12%. Okay, so would, would it be reasonable then uh, to, uh, to use an average of the last two years as a uh, as the assumption as the assumed uh, the assumed pharmacy trend in the rate filing. No, as I had referenced earlier, I think if anything should be used for this actual to expected comparison, it should be based on a population that's most similar to the population that was used to derive the expected, which would uh, yeah. be active. Sorry, sorry. Just, go ahead. Yep, uh, which would be actives, an active population in both, who's active in both time periods. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I should have been clearer. I'm not asking you about now the difference between the expected and the actual. What I'm asking is when you've got five numbers there in the actual column, just look at the actual column, that vary between 2.5 and 21.7, just looking at those numbers, there are various ways that are actuarially defensible, aren't there, to arrive at an assumption based on those five numbers. 
I would say using the actual population or if you somehow figured out a way to normalize the results for pharmacy risk adjustment, that those would both be reasonable techniques. Not making an adjustment for population changes, I don't think is reasonable. So uh, are, are you saying then that we shouldn't look at the numbers in the actual column in order to come up with an assumption for pharmacy trend in this year's filing? I think uh, I guess what I'm saying is we should include we should respect our PBM who understands um, their opinion, which is you know it's accounting for um, projected new drugs hitting the pipeline. They have their finger on the pulse of you know potential FDA changes to ind indications and expansions of indications. So it's basically utilizing it's it's relying on the subject matter expert to some extent for this information. And it's projecting future costs, not necessarily looking historically at the past. Um, so looking at the past could skew our results, especially given how wide of a range we've seen given our uh, population changes. Okay, so if if uh, if L &E, uh, wants to use a three-year average, or someone else wants to use a five-year average to uh, to arrive at the estimate for pharmacy trend for this year's filing, are you saying that's unreasonable? If it's not accounting for changes in population, yes. Okay. Um, do you have other numbers th than those that are in the expected column that do account for changes in population? I, I believe that we did a calculation in one of these exhibits of actual to actual. Um, I don't know the exact exhibit number offhand. Okay. And I don't want to take a, a whole lot of your time, but if you can, if you can locate that quickly, please do. If you know that we take a long time to uh, to locate that, I don't want to waste either your time or the board's time. Let me try to use uh, some technology available and see if I can find it quickly. If not, then I will not. No, I, I think it will. I don't think it would be a great use of our time, but we could follow up if needed. Very good. There are a lot of exhibits. No one can keep track of them all. Would you mind going back to exhibit one? I'm finished with exhibit four. And again, go back to. Uh, to page 14 of exhibit one. OK. And, and you see that in the middle of the page, medical trend factors, that heading. Yes. OK, and in the second paragraph, the, the, it, you, you state there that the, la, the uh, total allowed unit cost trend is three and a half for 2020, 5.1 for 2021. You see that? Yes. Okay. Why such a big, and, and then, and then 5.7 for 2022. Why such a big difference between the 3.5 trend for 2020 and the 5.1 for 2021? Um, the approved hospital budgets in 2020 were were lower on average. That was a big driver. Um, the 2021 um, approved hospital budgets included some sort of an increase for uh, for COVID to to help support hospitals. This is outside. I'm starting to venture outside of really my um, expertise, but that's my understanding. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Could could you? Could you go over that again to the extent that you do have the expertise? Yeah. Um, the you know, there's three different kinds of trends that we have that we're managing to for medical trends. One is uh, MVP's direct contracting efforts with providers and hospitals. That's in New York and some some providers in Vermont. Um, and then we rely on our we have a, a third party carrier that we that we uh, rent their network for um for national access to providers in case you're on vacation or something like that and then the third aspect of medical trend is the green mountain care board um under the green mountain care board's jurisdiction so in 2020 there was a lower trend approved by the board um because 2021 had an adjustment for uh covid to to help su support the, the hospitals because they had lower utilization and help support them. But again, that's my understanding. I don't want to step on toes. I'm starting to venture outside of my area of expertise. 
Very good. Um, can you go to the next paragraph? You see, starting with the MVP analyzed historical medical utilization trends. You see that? Yes. Okay. And so for utilization trend, you adopted a positive 1%, right? And that was originally recommended by MVP in connection with your rate filing of a couple of years ago. I think the 2019 rate filing. Do you remember that? This is um, that we're actually adopting LE's recommendation from the 2019 or 2020 rate filing. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Lombardo, I, I guess I misspoke. Yeah, I'm, did I say MVPs? I meant to say you adopted l es recommendation, correct? Correct. Okay. And when, when l and &E initially recommended that 1%, your own data showed 0%, right? Yes, but it's worth noting that our population, again, it's our population changes over time. Um, our risk adjustment as a percentage of premium was increasing as we were acquiring more business. Uh, and gaining market share, um, it's kind of flattened off. But in the first few years, we are we are attracting the healthiest risk. Those members utilize fewer services. Then we are paying back for that in risk adjustment, increased risk adjustment amounts. I hate to ask you to go back to Exhibit Four again after suggesting that I wasn't going to do it anymore, but I would like you to go to Exhibit Four and go to page 01014. Okay. Okay. And you see under the, the uh, line three year trends there, that's that's a utilization trend, right? That's correct. Okay. And so can you explain and, and what data did you use uh, to, uh, what was the data you used on which this line here, these three year trends from the fifth percentile to the 95 percentile are based? We use historical data excluding um you know stopping in in february of 2020 because then the data and the and the utilization was skewed due to uh due to covid okay and if you remember lat so you use three year trend you, you this is based on a three year trend correct that's correct we're using 2019 data so we were projecting to 2022 okay and you remember last year though you only used a two year trend correct Correct, because we use 2019 data. Yeah. Okay, and that and that data showed a lower uh, range of trends, didn't it? I would have to go back. Um, I would have to go back. Okay. To why, don't, why don't you go back then and turn to Exhibit B, page 17. Okay. Exhibit B is in the very back of your binder. Okay. Are you there? I'm getting there. I, this is one of the ones I had difficulty take time, printing out. Take your time. I know it's a nuisance. You there? I shut down my Outlook earlier because I was getting um, notifications. I want to be able to focus, so it's just taking me a minute. I am no one to criticize anyone for not being able to pull something up on the computer. Um, if you can't, I can just describe it to you, and I think you can give me a. Nope, I, yep, I, I'm getting there right now. So right. was this one actually is printed out? Okay. It was exhibit exhibit A or exhibit B? Exhibit sorry. B, page seventeen. Okay. Okay. And so you see that there on, on page 17, you're using a two year trend. And there, the 50th yes. percentile is a negative six one hundredths of a point, right? Yes. Okay. And then uh, you're using a three year trend in this year's filing, and it produces a trend that's a little bit higher. Uh, my question is. First question is, why did you use a two-year trend last year and a three-year trend this year? 
Last year we used 20, they're both using 2019 data. One is projected to 2021 and one is projected to 2022. Or sorry, yeah, yeah. Last year we projected 2019 to 2021. Now we're projecting 2019 to 2022. Back on exhibit one, could you turn please to page 15? You there? I'm there now. Good. Uh, down at the bottom of the page, you see the subhead paid claim surcharges and so forth. Correct. OK. Um, the, the last line of that paragraph uh, refers to a surcharge levied by the state of Massachusetts. Do you see that? Yes. OK. Why should Vermonters pay for that? It's um, it's a surcharge levied by the state of Massachusetts um, for members enrolled in a Vermont plan utilizing those services. It's not for we don't part, we don't operate in Massachusetts, but we do participate with um, providers and hospitals in the state of Massachusetts. So if someone purchases a Vermont in a Vermont enrolled COPE plan goes to Massachusetts, uh, the state of Vermont applies a, a charge on the claims uh, to account for those services, just like a little tax that they charge us. And and why is it why should it be paid by solely by Vermonters rather than uh, rather than by all MVP insureds? It's uh, we're setting our rates based on the data presented in front of us. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and the data presented in front of us in this case is Vermont small group and Vermont individual data. Vermont members are utilizing those services in Vermont and Massachusetts. So we're passing on that cost into the Vermont premium rates. Uh, otherwise, it would be it wouldn't be actuarially sound. Do you do the same thing for New York residents? Uh, yes. Who, who uh, use services in Massachusetts? Yeah, if, if it's a cost that's levied on us, um, we may not call it out specifically, but we do include it. OK, could you turn now to page 17 of exhibit one? OK. OK, and uh, down near the bottom of the page, you see the sub subhead and italics contribution to reserves risk charge. You see that? Yes. OK. And you talk there about statutory reserve requirements for MVPs, Vermont block of business. Do you see that? Yep. Okay. MVPs, MVP surplus, excuse me, on its annual statement is indivisible, isn't it? You don't have certain surplus designated for uh, New York business and other surplus for, for, for Vermont business, do you? That's uh, that's outside of my my domain. I would have to defer to our accounting team who prepares the income statements and the balance sheet. You don't know. You think maybe that there are uh, that, that there may be separate requirements for uh, Vermont uh, attributable surplus, and on the other hand, uh, other requirements for New York attributable surplus. Objection. He already indicated he doesn't have the knowledge. It's sustained. Are you familiar with MVP's annual statement? I am familiar with it. I don't know it inside and out. I I'm sorry, you don't know what? I don't know it inside and out, but I'm familiar with just on a high level, a couple of the exhibits I, am, uh, I know, but I don't know every single exhibit that's included. Okay. Uh, when you talk about statutory reserve requirements for MVPs for Vermont block of business, what are you referring to? It is, um, there's a couple of different ways you can measure uh, solvency. Uh, one is RBC, another is as a percentage of premium. 
New York State, who is, you know, who is is the regulatory body um, for our, you know, where we're domiciled, they view our reserve requirements as a percentage of premium. Essentially, if you fall below a certain percentage of premium, then you're at risk of not being able to pay pay claims and causing market instability. So there's concern that if your solvency is too low, then you need to somehow find a way to add to that, add to your balance sheet. If you're too high, um, then you know you you may you, you may then the questions may come from the regulatory body of what do you plan doing with those reserves, um, how are how are your reserves changing over time, all of that analysis. New York State doesn't require you, though, does it, to set aside a certain amount of surplus <clears throat> for Vermont business? That would be a question that I would have that we would have to ask uh, the Department of Financial Services. I think they view our legal entities in whole to ensure that we can provide market stability and we don't go insolvent. Point. Could you turn to page <clears throat> 54 of Exhibit 1? Did you say 54? 54, 054. Okay, I'm there. Okay, and that's headed pricing trend assumptions, right? Yes. Okay, and so <clears throat> the 1% utilization uh, trend there we already talked about. What? Let me ask you about the unit cost trend. Can you tell me why there is such a big difference between the unit cost for inpatient and outpatient on the one hand and for physician and other on the other hand yeah i mean other is included in there so to address that first um we we changed the way that we're bucketing our claims to eliminate the other uh category but we kept in there to be consistent with prior years in the future we can remove that um in general though inpatient and outpatient trend at higher rates than physician trends um that's something that I think there's more overhead costs, so they they generally have to increase at a higher rate, and there's more more services being performed and technology at a facility than there is um, at a provider's office. So generally speaking, facility trends do exceed physician trends. Is it as far as you know, or is it typical for physician uh, for facility trends to be four times the uh, physician trend? That's not totally out of the realm of reasonability. I mean, that is generally we see that physician trends are a couple of percent and facility trends are in somewhere in the four to seven percent range on average. Um, could you turn please to page 56 of exhibit one? Okay. Okay, and what I'd like you to try to do is to explain to the extent you can in common sense terms, <clears throat> the difference between the number on line 14, the number on line 29, and the number on line 31. Line 14 is our 2019 data adjusted for um, for high cost claimants, what we do is high cost claims, there's a variation around high cost claims. Um, tail, basically, you know, mathematically, tail expectation is hard to predict. There's a high variance around it. So rather I, I, than. I, Mr. Lombard, I want to make sure that I'm on the, on the right page. This is, yeah. th this is the one in, entitled Development of Index PM, PM Claim Rate. Yeah, I'm just trying to um, explain okay. how we get to line 14, but if you want me to bypass that, it's basically 2019 data no, let, with let some me, adjustments to the actual 2019 claim year. Let me ask you a better question. The, the, there are three different numbers, each of which differs by about 100 bucks. On line 14, there is the four, 40970. Yep. On line 29, there's 514 and change. And on line 31, there's the 608 and change. And so uh, if you can, could you just explain in common sense terms how the 409 becomes 514 and then explain how the 514 becomes 608? Yeah, 
Uh, the 409, we have to we make a couple of adjustments for new benefits or benefit changes um, that are going to occur between 2019, our experience period, and 2022. And then we apply medical and pharmacy trend as well as uh, non system claim expense, expenses, which are in lines 27 and 28. That gets us to that 51499 and line 29. The next adjustment is for the federal risk adjustment program. We're paying into risk adjustment. What that's basically saying is um, MVP's individual population is healthier than our competitors. And as a result, we have to pay into risk adjustment again to level the playing field, as I was talking about earlier. Okay, I I get the 514 to the 608. I let me just ask you for a little more detail about going from the 414 to the 514. You're saying that much of that is due to trend. To go from the 414 to the to 503 in line 26, it's all yeah. that is that's the impact of three years of trend. That's and then we have trend. that's trend. I, I'm sorry. So so to go from the 414 to the 503. That's all trend. Yes. Okay. Um. Is there a rule of thumb as to how much a uh, a point of trend is worth uh, as a part of in a rate increase? That is, can you translate a point of trend into a dollar amount of the rate increase? Um. I mean, I would. The easiest thing to do would be to look at line 31 where a paid index rate is. Um, and then, you know, there's some non claim expense items, but a ballpark estimate would be 1% of that figure uh, with a little bit of a, an adjustment from there. Very good. Could you turn to page 58 of that same exhibit? Okay. OK, and then you see on the, the second from the bottom percent of paid claim taxes and assessments, you see that? Yes. OK, I see the Vermont paid claim surcharge, but under that I see a New York State HCRA surcharge. What is that? It's very similar to that um, Massachusetts surcharge that we talked about that in the in the prior section, uh, probably about 10 minutes ago. It's there's if if a Vermont member utilizes services at a New York hospital, there's an additional tax that's added to that claim, um, which is then, you know, that's what's being reflected in that line. OK. Um, so you're, you're saying you have no choice but to uh, include that assessment as part of the rate filing. Yeah, we, we have to pay that every year um, on our claims for Vermont members utilizing New York facilities. Okay, could you turn to page 59, the next page? Okay. Okay. On line six, you see the annual trend factor there of 1.014. Um, did, yes. I say, um, did I say page six on line six, annual trend? Yep, yep, I see it. Yeah, 1.014. Yeah. Okay. Why is that trend so much lower than the trends that you showed on the preceding pages? I'd have to go back to the memorandum, but it's only trending a component of those amounts. Where, I, If I recall, it's only trending amounts that are um, subject to the deductible. I'd have to go back to our memo just to confirm that. Um, or one of the exhibits, but it's 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 a subset of our full trend. We don't have to trend, you know, if it's a copay that's being used, we don't have to apply. So what the CSR is trying to do is cover the reductions to cost that a member is, you know, so if if I'm in a CSR plan, um, the base silver plan may have a $50 copay, but if I'm in the CSR plan, it may be a $10 copay. That forty dollars of of you know copay costs is what's captured in the data here. In that case, we wouldn't need to trend the copay amount if the benefit design isn't changing. We'd only want to account for any kind of utilization trend. So it's not um, you know we're not we wouldn't have to worry about unit cost impacting those increases in that case. 
Okay. Could you turn play, please, to exhibit 12? Okay. Okay, and turn to page four of exhibit 12, please. Okay. Okay, and you recall a little while ago we were talking about IBNR factors, right? Yes. Okay, so this shows the IBNR, IBNR factor by month for both small group and individual, right? Yes, for 2020 through 202104. Right. How, and so there, as you see there, they're mainly just a little above one for March 2021, more than a little above one. But then for April 2021, you've got a factor there at 2.878. Why is that so big? Uh, that's just the way that claims complete. I mean, if you were to incur claim a claim right now, in all likelihood, it wouldn't be paid in the month of July. That's what that's telling us. Um, and that's all based on the way we develop those completion factors or the IBNR factor is based on our historically, how quickly does you know a, a given month complete? So on average, what we see is that um, you know, April of 2021, the incurred estimate, we would expect to increase by a factor of 2.878 because of, uh, you know, there, a lot of claims just haven't been processed at this point, especially higher cost claims. And is it fair to say that uh, the more recent the claim data is, the more uncertain the ultimate is going to be? Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. Um, Mr. Lombardo, uh, have you looked at the Blue Cross rate filing? I'm more familiar with just what how our competitive position will look based on proposed rates than anything else. I, I know, you know, they made some they use 2020 data. I know they have a favorable um, some favorable pharmacy assumptions. Beyond that, though, I, I haven't spent too much time focused on that. Um, uh, so do, do you know that, that the Blue Cross in the Blue Cross rate following the Blue Cross actually has included a substantial factor in the rate filing for recoveries uh, pursuant to the risk card of program litigation. I I was not aware of that. Okay, do you know what that litigation is? Risk corridor is based on uh, 2014 through 2016 ACA compliant data. And there was a mechanism available where if you either made more money than your target or lost more money than you expected then there was a sharing of those losses um so that that is the risk corridor program and it was repealed under president trump's administration to say uh because he said that you know we're not bailing out insurance companies basically if you're receiving money um that meant that you underpriced your plans and you were losing money um so I don't agree with his assessment that we were, it was a bailout. It was because the ACA was new and there were a lot of unknowns that were taking place and carrier, it was hard to, it was hard to project costs. I'm not characterizing anything as a bailout. I'm just, and, and you know, don't you, that the, the, the industry, you guys won before the Supreme Court. You're suing the federal government to get paid. The Supreme Court said, insurance companies, you're right, you will get paid, correct? Correct. But you haven't included anything for that in your rate filing. That was from 2014, 2015, and 2016. We're using 2019 data to set our rates, including an adjustment for a time period that is way before um, when you set your rates or your experience period. That that would not that isn't that shouldn't be factored into your projected costs in the future. It could be something that's behind the scenes impacting things, but it shouldn't be explicitly called out, in my opinion. Uh, so then, what does what does MVP do with that risk card or money? It is in our. It was an addition to our reserves. Um, we can use it how we see fit. I have no more questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Lombardo. Thank you. All right. Now we're going to move to. Uh, mm -hmm. 
questions from board members. Like I said, uh, I'd like to start with member Yusufer. Um, sure, thank you. <laughs> um, Matt, what is the impact of the price transparency rule um, whereby consumers can shop for lower price and how can MVP encourage people to shop for lower prices and thereby reduce their claims expenses? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I mean, as of right now, there's a lot of question marks around how the transparency tool is going to roll out. Um, and this is based on information that you know I've learned from our contracting team um, and just reading publications. But it's a reasonable approximation for upfront comparisons, but it could produce misleading results, which is kind of what the industry is scared about. So you may see upfront okay, MVP costs this, Cigna costs this, Blue Cross costs this, and make your purchasing decision based on that. But when you actually go into, um, when you actually go to the hospital, it may be a much different charge because there could be unintended claims that are, you know, or conditions that are uh, uncovered, which could then skew your results. I think in the long run, we, we think it's a, it's a great idea. Transparency is gonna be helpful and it could help manage costs. But at this time, I think we need to see how it actually rolls out um, to, to actually see how effective it can be. There could be huge changes in the way reimbursement is provided and the way that we're, you know, every carrier is paying hospitals and hospitals may have to change their charge masters as a result. But at this time, um, you know, it, it's unknown, it's unclear how things are gonna be impacted. We would love it if we could identify how we benchmark against other competitors and uh, use that to our advantage in contract negotiations. On the flip side, where we have an advantage that may actually end up coming back to haunt us. So I think it's really an unknown at this point, um, but we we do want to utilize the information to the to the best of our ability to help reduce claim costs and unit costs at our hospitals. Yeah, and I was also looking at it um, not against other insurers, but against you know, other provider types or different hospitals, you know, how consumers could use it to potentially lower the costs and how you guys could help to support that. That's yeah, what that, I was looking uh, at. Okay, yeah, I, I mean, that's a, that's a helpful point of feedback. I can, you know, I can bring that back to our marketing team. Um, we do have a price transparent, shouldn't call it price transparency tool. We have a shop a tool where you can, you know, cost calculator right now that already exists that you can go on and type in a service that you think is going to be rendered and it will benchmark uh, the cost at, you know, facility A versus facility B or provider A versus provider B. So that information is available and we do communicate that readily to our members um, in hopes of leading them to receiving quality care at the best rate. Um, to The more that we can educate members on that and they, and, and there's you know, better utilization patterns and higher quality delivered, that's going to help us uh, contain costs or reduce costs or mitigate cost increases as much as possible. And that's going to lead right into a more favorable premium rate. So, um, yeah, we, we definitely support that. And we do try to inform members about that, uh, that, that comparison tool rate right when you enroll with MVP. Thank you. Um you talked a little bit about how you assess the pharmacy benefits manager um, and, you know, you didn't specifically say when the timing of when that contract comes up. Um, and, and you also talked about, you know, there's some big undertakings, back end processing and things like that if you are ever to switch. Um, but, you know, as you alluded to as well, um, in the Blue Cross filings, there there was a significant change um, and benefit to the policyholders with the change from their PBM. And, and just, you know, can you talk about when your contract comes up and the potential at that point of potential savings? That is something that I would have to follow up with our pharmacy team about. Um, what I will say is, you know, immediately when we saw that information from Blue Cross, the first person I shared it with was our pharmacy VP to say, you know, hey, I just want to let you know that this is out there and um, here's the vendor that they're using. And, you know, when we do come up for RFP, uh, you know, or when we're having contract mid-year, mid-contract conversations, this may be worthwhile. But at the same time, to, to, to bring up to CVS, 
But at the same time, we did look at the projected costs that we have for pharmacy versus our competitor using the URT information. And what we're projecting for costs as a percentage of total costs, I think that because of risk adjustment and population differences, I think that's the only reasonable way to do it. Um, we, we saw that we're reasonably well aligned with them. I don't remember which market it is, but one market we were slightly lower than them on a percentage of total cost for pharmacy and one market we were slightly higher than them. But in, on average, I think that we're in the ballpark with where they're projecting to be in 2022. Okay. Um, can you talk about some specific cost saving initiatives you might have and when the impacts will be expected and, and how much, you know, potentially, um, you know, we could see? I know there's a push toward um, understanding low value care, and I know that's something that the board asked questions about. We're working on developing models uh, and, and reporting and dashboards to help us understand the low value care that we're that we're seeing uh, delivered to to help reduce costs. Um, we're also measuring when we have a value based partnership. Are there certain providers that are driving quality and lower costs on a risk adjusted basis than others? Um, that's helping us evaluate who our network partners should be and um, if there needs to be changes to our provider network. But that also always has to be balanced with member satisfaction um, because when you tell somebody that their PCP is no longer going to be in the network, you know, a lot of times that can cause a lot of member upheaval. Um, so we, we just have to do it very carefully in a very measured and data driven approach. And well, you know, what about specifically in fraud, waste, and abuse, and saving money in those categories? That is not an area that I go into a great amount of detail for. Um, when something comes up, my team identified an issue in our New York individual block. I alluded to when Mr. Angoff was cross-examining me. Yeah, we had some adverse experience in our New York individual block that we're remediating. Um, that was something that. We had identified in the actuarial team and we brought that to the fraud waste and abuse team um, that's kind of where i start getting involved with fraud waste and abuse is if if we identify something we're very quick to address that with the fraud waste and abuse team but in terms of just strategy and development of new initiatives um, that's not an area that i can speak to and comment on okay um I also want to take a look at Exhibit 15 and specifically page, uh, let me start with page six. Oops, sorry, start with page uh, 10. Okay. So when just looking at um, the I guess premiums earned um, on the first section under premiums, it looks like um, under the individual market, it's about 94.5 million and the small group was about 113.2. Yeah. And then flipping to the next page, looking at the underwriting gains or losses, um, 2 million on the individual market, so a little over 2%, and 6 million on the small group market, so almost 5 to 6%. Yep. I'm, and yep. then I want to contrast that to <laughs> that number to page, uh, um, page 17. So in the total line 11, um, I guess in the total individual market, you lost 40 million roughly. And Vermont, you actually had a gain of 2 million. And in the small group, you made 11.2 million. And in Vermont, um, half of that came from Vermont. You know, it represents about 7% of the premium holders. So, you know, I know you talked about you don't necessarily look back and give that money back, but you know it, it just appears. And um, the prior year, there also was some benefits from from the Vermont market that 
you know, the Vermont market is is subsidizing those losses that you have in New York. And when you look to see that you were going about 17% in the New York market for premiums and 17% in the Vermont, you know, how, how can we think about, you know, giving that those big gains back to the Vermont market and not subsidizing the surplus in such a way um, to help offset I guess your huge losses you have in New York. Um, yeah, that's fair. When we set our rates, we're setting them based on just the specific populations, uh, but I, I don't agree with the uh, assessment that we're subsidizing losses across companies. We did lose a significant amount of money in our individual New York population. Um, I would characterize it, there's a significant amount of adverse selection where two small populations kind of adversely selected against us and kind of sucker punched us and caught us off guard. Uh, we're trying to remediate that. But when we're setting our rates in Vermont, we're only focused on our Vermont block of business. And what we're actually seeing emerge in 2021, I, I recognize that our profit margin in 2020 exceeded our target, but it's worth noting that in 2021, um, we're seeing very unfavorable claim trend. We thought that the second half of 2020 was post pandemic and we were experiencing pent up demand. Starting in March, we've seen a huge ramp up in services that we're ba based on the type of service. We think they're deferred services um, that were that were delayed until people were fully vaccinated. When we look at our internal run rate reporting for our Vermont block business in 2021, we're actually projecting to be about eight to ten percent behind our target, and that's because of this huge ramp up in outpatient surgeries, um, colonoscopies, laparoscopies, well visits, the associated labs that go along with them. So if you were to look at our, based on what we're seeing right now in 2021, if you were to look at 2020 plus 2021, I would not expect to see us exceeding target profit margins over that two year time period. So um, 2020, we benefited from reduced utilization in, due to COVID, 2021, we're actually feeling the exact opposite of that. We had built in a pent up demand factor into our rates last year. And based on what we're seeing emerge, we were, there is pent up demand. We were right about that, but the magnitude of it was incorrect. It's actually far exceeds uh, the actuals versus what we were expecting. Okay, but we can't see that yet, but we can see the benefits from 20 um, coming in, but um, okay. On exhibit 17, Uh, you just need some help in looking at I mean, when we build up the 17% increase, there's the component for the utilization um, and medical trend, which equaled the 6.9, you know, on just the medical trend or the 7.9 on the trend from 21 to 22. But then when you go into the other risk factors where on line, page five, line seven, the 6.7 percent, you know, of which um, Eleni had characterized that as COVID and, and you specifically state it wasn't COVID. Um, how do we look at both of those increases? So a 7.9 and then a 6.7. Um, how do I separate out like what is actually trend and what is utilization in total? Because it seems like the combination of those two. So, so if, if I look at, I, I guess if you could tell me of that 14.6%, how much would you say is, is trend and how much is utilization? So um, the... 7.9% is truly just our medical and pharmacy trend that we expect to see from 20, comparing 2022 over 2021. It's that additional year of trend. Um, now, the exact calculation of that, I'd have to look into it if, you know, if everything ties out to the way, you know, our rates are developed. But just that is actually an expected, expected increase in cost from 2021 to 2022. Okay. The COVID adjust I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's what, but then I'm having trouble with the 6.7 yep. on top of that, of which there was a couple small pieces that were related to 
you know, some other things, but the bulk of it was. The COVID adjustment factor. What that is getting at is, um, so if I, were, I think maybe a timeline, I'll try to like summarize in a timeline. We're using 2019 data to set 2022 rates, as you're aware. Um, if you were to take 2019 and then trend it to, and what this is basically saying, if we take 2019 and trend it to 2022, and then we took our 2020 data and trend it to 2022, the difference in those two projections, both of them would include 7.9% for 2021 to 2022, but the projected total dollar amount using 2020 data versus 2019 data is a 6.5% difference, which we're attributing to COVID. So it's more of a normalization factor to account for suppressed utilization and all the changes that we had uh, spoken about in 2020 due to COVID. So why can't we, since it's just, you know, that 6.5%, would be roughly what 12 13 million dollars yeah and that i mean that exceeds um all of our profit um we would have lost about four million five million dollars if we passed through that full amount i think another way of thinking about that is if covid didn't exist i think 2020 would have been a very unfavorable year we have lost a significant amount Right, but you didn't, right? So, so twenty twenty, we just we just showed the gains, and now it seems like we're saying we're going to have that come back as a, as a COVID adjustment because of higher utilization, um, more than what you gained. But you know, I, I just want to try to look at, you know, trying to offset some of that, right? Because in Vermont specifically, you know, forget what happened in New York, we specifically saw gains in twenty twenty that you now seem to be rolling forward to to say on top of the 7.9 to put in another six and a half percent um, is really picking up some of that of which we already saw the benefit. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to look at how do we how do we accommodate for that? Yeah, I, I think that I don't I wouldn't view the six and a half percent, though, as just a, an adjustment factor to say you know, this translates to a uh, profit of 12 to 13 million. I just, you know, I think I look at it as if we included that adjustment, we would have been in the hole by um, quite a few million dollars. And now we're experiencing this ramp up in claims in 2021 due to 2020. And if we were just to take kind of a long view of looking at the data, and this is, gets to the whole reason why we didn't want to use 2020 data, um, if we look at this over, instead of just choosing a 12 month time period, we looked at our data over a 24 month time period. I think what we'll find is that we actually performed adversely relative to expectations. 2020, we we reported a profit of uh, three and a half to four percent, I believe. Um, and, you know, as of right now, we're eight to 10 percent behind. So um, if I'm hoping that doesn't persist, and I hope that on average we get back to around a one percent, you know, one and a half percent target profit margin. Um, and I guess we just need time to figure that out. But as of right now, I, I, I would, I just would proceed with, you know, I just want to caution that the six and a half percent just kind of normalizes our projection for 2020's suppression. And when we do that normalization, we would actually be generating a loss in 2020. Would you say for if we were to to look ahead to 2023, would you expect this six and a half percent to come out in 2023? And that you know, because it, it seems like we're working. You know, we're we're again we we got the 7.9 um, in total for your trends, and then on top of that another 6.5. You know, would that be potentially going to come out in 2023? So if we, when we're sitting here next year, I'm assuming we would use 2021 data to set our rates. Um, and what is not clear right now, based on the type of services where we're seeing this adverse experience, it appears to be some level of pent up demand where people are getting caught up from deferred for services in 2020 until they're vaccinated. Um, what isn't known though, is if this is just a new normal. It, 
our job as actuaries is to try to project costs into the projection period. If 2021 data is arbitrarily increased because of pent up demand, there will be a, an offset that we would want to make to account for that projection to 2023. If it's a new normal, then um, that's concerning and that would have that should be passed through to 2023 if we um, if we want to set an actuarially sound rate. And but I, am, I yep, sorry. No, and what about the theory of you know surplus reserves should be held to cover things like pandemics? So whereas there actually was a benefit clearly in 2020 from Vermont you know, not, not necessarily from the rest of your business. Um, and then we're adding in additional expected utilization because of withholds primarily due to COVID. Why wouldn't that roll through um, reserves? And that's what they're there for, right? This kind of unexpected. Yeah. And then we should normalize back in theory in, in 2022, 20, 2023 to not have those. We we have a you know working with um, New York State DFS who regulates our solvency. There's kind of a target range of percentage of premium that we that we manage to in terms of reserves, <clears throat> and um, we were at the we were in that range, but we were at the lower end of the range in 20 heading into 2020. So even though 2020 was a favorable year, we're still in that well within that range that our <clears throat> Uh, solvency regulators are recommending that we be within. We're not pushing towards the top of it or outside of it. If we're outside of that range, I think that's where you start really having to assess what we should be doing to to try to reduce premiums or make some adjustments. But when you're in that, when we're in that range of uh, the target range that DFS has established, then um, you know that's where we then we don't have an adjustment to make for that. Okay, just one more question. When you look at your reserves and surpluses in total, do you look at it by what's contributed by market in total, or are you looking at it just in total, um, you know, and the drivers there? So, because I'm just concerned with obviously the Vermont, New York piece, but, you know, how, how do you look at reserves from or the contributions from each state? I would have to work with our uh, accounting or financial planning team to fully understand how they're allocating those reserves um, if they are being allocated um, by state. I believe that they try to, you know, they kind of break them out based on where our total total shape, where we totally shake out in terms of percentage of premium and our total reserves. But I would need to work with them to fully understand how they're allocating those out and measuring solvency for both of them. We've been charging though a consistent, we've been adding in a consistent contribution to reserves into our rates. Um, and you know, from year to year we we oscillate, but um we're we we have not had huge profit years. Uh I know that we generated around eight million of profit last year, which is a couple of percentage points above target. Um, but we also, as an organization, we were concerned based on all the conversations we were having, what's gonna happen in 2021. Uh, with that all the pent up demand that we were expecting to experience and it's coming to fruition. So um, any kind of understanding of an analysis though of reserves by state, we would I would have to work with our finance team. Okay, and actually do have one more question, which is um, you know, I guess you assumed the same number of um, people would be in your filing this year as it was to last year, but that was before you saw the competitive rates in the marketplace, your competitors rates, which because of their, um, your much larger rate requests compared to theirs, the um, comparable plans are much closer. Yeah. Um, and so I guess, you know, reflecting on that, you know, do you think you might have, you might lose membership related to to the plan, you know, based on your assumptions, you know, I, you don't know what your assumptions were when you built them, but you know, how yep. does that impact? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we're aware of how our premiums are stacking up based on proposed rates. Um, I think what will ultimately alter our decision is the the approved rates. Um, you know, that consumers are going to purchase plans based on as long as consumers 
have had a positive experience with MVP. We don't have a reason to believe that they would walk away from us if if our premium rates are well aligned with our in, in the market. Um, if we're expensive, if we're significantly more expensive, we may expect to lose membership. Uh, but if we're reasonably well aligned, then we think that you know we should be able to retain market share. Ultimately, what's going to matter is where does our where do our approved rates fall? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I'm all set, Mike. All right, thank you. Thank you, Member Lunge. Do you have questions? I do. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, how are you today? Good, thank you. Um, so I wanted, if you could please turn to Exhibit 8, page <laughs> 5. I had a couple of questions related to your administrative expenses for um, beginning the individual market billing. So um, in, quest in question 10, um, you included per member per month um, breakdown of billing related costs for individual and small group markets. These appear to be the total cost, not the incremental cost for assuming the VHA billing. Am I reading that correctly? Correct. Okay. And then I believe in exhibit 10, also coincidentally on page five, you indicated that the total amount you're estimating uh, for the individual billing activities is 0 0.3 million. Um, and is it, can you, and you may not be able to do this in your head, but can you, can you either confirm that LE's estimate that that is $3.32 PM PM is correct or uh, give us a revised estimate? That seems reasonable, just eye eyeballing these two figures. Um, that that seems reasonable, and I don't have any reason to think that's an incorrect calculation. Um, I believe, though, that the data on page in Exhibit 10, it's material increases. So the Exhibit 8 and the Exhibit 8 figure is um the total cost yeah and exhibit 10 is incremental costs i think that's the difference yes yes and i was trying to understand the incremental cost from the new billing activities <clears throat> okay yep and I, I i believe that our financial planning team is estimating that the incremental cost will be approximately three hundred thousand dollars okay thank you um, I did have some questions related to telehealth. Um, and thank you for uh, going over the DFR order and um, how that relates to the assumptions in your filing. So um, hold on just one second. I think it is exhibit. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, I made you guys wait doing this too. So that's okay. Um, I, before I ask you about this, I should confirm. So in in exhibit um, exhibit four a page ten include a telehealth exhibit which i want to confirm whether that is public or private before i or confidential before i ask you about it it's also exhibit 10 um page six whichever one is easier for you to get to yeah um, this is so i believe exhibit four yep yeah. i what page are we on, Robin, of Exhibit 4A? Uh, Sorry. Uh, so I actually realized that under Exhibit 4A, I don't have the exhibit included. So for in my binder, it's Exhibit 10, page 6, where I actually can see the exhibit. There's a reference in Exhibit 4A. Um, 
Okay. Yep. I, yeah, I don't. Okay. I don't believe we put this. This is not confidential. Okay. That's my understanding. Great. Okay. Good. I didn't. I wanted to make sure I was doing everything on the up and up here. So, um, in looking at this exhibit, which um, my understanding is, this is an exhibit which details how you built your dollar eighty nine pm pm telehealth increase assumption. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And as you testified earlier, behavioral health seems to be a primary driver of telehealth. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and you also have an assumption in your filing related to mental health utilization being increased. Uh, I believe unit costs were assuming an increase for mental health services. Um, you know, there's parity rules that are parity laws that exist, and we, we have to ensure that our contracts are aligned. Okay. Um, and so earlier you testified that uh, one of the other drivers of the increased uh, telehealth utilization was duplicative services. Yes. <clears throat> and please relate to relate that to the behavioral health utilization in telehealth. It's not something that we we have specifically called out anywhere. Um, so it is just, I think overall though, what we're experiencing is an increase in telehealth utilization more than anything else. If you look at, um, so the duplicative efforts, which that, that there could be some duplicative efforts in there. Um, mm -hmm. I can't speak to exactly how much of that is duplicative at this point. This is a this is something that we're talking about though as an organization is how do we identify these kind of services and and ensure that we're providing quality care but we're not providing too much costly care. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so so the examples that you gave earlier, which were primary care examples, is how I would qualify that. You can tell me if that's not fair. Um, where would I see the financial impact in this exhibit? We don't break it out specifically, um, and I use those as examples. We're seeing it not just in primary care. We're seeing it in, in specialty visits, um, dermatology phone calls, radiology, things like that. It's not just, um, these aren't just um, primary care, pediatrician, behavioral health changes. We're seeing them in in all, all kinds of provider types. Um, okay. So when I look at this exhibit, um, and if I compare um, the pre-pandemic average monthly allowed amount for office PCP, you'll see that's the one to third column of numbers over. Um, when I compare the pre, and I add in both office PCP and telehealth PCP, and I compare pre-pandemic, which is um, I'm using the PMPM 2961, which is under office PCP plus telehealth PCP is zero. I have pre-pandemic 2961. Post-pandemic for office PCP, I see $24.04 plus $3.64, which is telehealth PCP, I get $27.68. So that's in fact a $2 PMPM less post-pandemic than pre-pandemic. Am I reading that right? I, I agree with that, yes. Okay, thank you. And then for the, um, you also have a category office other. Um, and if I do sim a similar look, I see a, a small, in so for, uh, again, uh, office other $11.21 PM, PM, telehealth other five cents, gives me $11.26. Post-pandemic, $10.13, office other plus $2.05, uh, gives me $12.18. So a little less than a dollar increase total. I, I agree That's with that. Right. The, yep, the one caveat I would provide though is post-pandemic in this case is second mm -hmm. half of 2020. Based on what's actually happening in 2021, um, 
you know, we think we we were assuming that that was covering that was a normal level. It feels based on what we're seeing right now, we think that those PCP and um, basically all those columns could be except for behavioral health could be could have been suppressed for that comparison. So I just think that's important to take with a grain of salt. OK, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, if we could turn now to exhibit eight. <clears throat> okay. Um, I had a question on, so this is on page three. And a follow up question to your answer on question four. So, question four asks you to detail um, your payments into the um, Learning Action Network framework established by the federal government, which tries to measure. Uh, value-based care into different categories that they define. Um, and I just wanted to uh, confirm uh, my assumption that the 29% you have under all pair models built on fee-for-service architecture, would that be uh, the One Care ACO program or would that include other programs that you have available? Uh, your assumption is correct. That 29% is One Care um, and, th and that's it. Okay, and um, even though it's listed as upside gain sharing, my understanding is that your contract has both up and downside risk. No, it's it's only um, it's level one, only so one. it's only it's only there's no downside risk being taken by one care at this point. Okay, and why is that? Um, that would have to defer to our contracting team. We we would prefer to move them to a level two or a level three up and downside or capitation model. Um, but I, I don't know if there's, I, I can't speak to the details of those negotiations. I would have to defer to them. Are they here to answer my question? No, but we could, I can definitely follow up with them as needed. Okay. I would prefer that you do that. And I, and quite frankly, I think this is going to be an area that the board is very interested in. And I'll just speak for myself to say that it's, uh, it is an area that it would be better if you could please bring witnesses who can answer the questions relating to value-based care in the future. Um, so if you could please follow up in terms of the contract information related to moving the ACO program into downside risk or into a population-based payment. Um, and I actually have several questions related to that, but I think if if your contract team could get back to us in terms of uh, sort of an expectation for how they would uh, expect that contract negotiation to be furthered in the future, that would be great. Um, my next question relates to uh, question five, which is the efforts to move individuals who are enrolled directly Oh, I'm sorry, it's not question five. It's question. Hold on. Question. No. Nine, I believe it is. So page four to five. So uh, currently in uh, in prior years, there were a number of efforts for, to ensure that individuals who did not receive subsidies were enrolled directly with the carrier in order to ensure that the silver loading did not adversely affect their premiums. Um, with the new ARPA subsidies, uh, that, is, that effort is being reversed to try and get people enrolled directly with Vermont Health Connect. Can you give us an update on those <laughs> efforts and how many members are currently have been switched over to Vermont Health Connect? out of a total yep. individual as, enrollment. As of June, um, we've seen a reduction of directly enrolled members of about 220 members, while our overall individual population has grown by about 80 members. So our assumption is that you know those 220 members are still with us and they shifted um, away. So it seems like our efforts are working. And I know our contracting, you know, our communication team wants to is working on a, a full rollout plan to try to ensure that um, policyholders are maximizing the, those ARPA subsidies. And do you um, 
At how many total individual subscribers do you have directly enrolled? Um, I don't have a cur the, that that number. I only had members. We don't have actual subscribers that are currently. Um, oh, members enrolled. is fine. Sorry, members yeah, is fine. Would, Oh, it was uh, 2,170 members, directly enrolled members are currently in our population. Okay, so out of 202, I'm sorry, out of how many? 2,170 members? Correct. About at last count as of June, 220 had switched over. Um, so, so we, in, in this response, we had quoted our direct enrolled members as of April. That was 2,391. Okay. So we've seen 220 fewer members directly enrolled as of June to get to that 2,170. I got it. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Okay. And how many members would you expect to, to shift? I would hope um, all of them that are eligible for ARPA subsidies. Um, I don't mm -hmm. think we've, I don't think we've established a, uh, an, a targeted number um, that's based on people, you know, policyholders being willing to change and adapt and, and reading their mail. I don't know if our marketing team has come up with a figure, but I don't have a figure. Again, the hope would be that everybody would leverage and take advantage of those subsidies to help reduce their out-of-pocket expenses. Sure, sure. That would definitely be the hope. I'm trying to establish the reality. <laughs> Um, we can provide an update as needed. I mean, we only get monthly. We won't have July figures for another few weeks. So, but to the extent okay. that that's something that you guys request, you know, you can email. Feel free to email me or um, Chris Pontiff on my team, and we can provide that as needed throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, so I wanted to turn to your pre-filed testimony, which is Exhibit 18, 16, excuse me. Exhibit 16, page 18. You can let me know when you're there. It's hard to move things around in the binder. There's a lot of paper. Yeah, and this is where I think I'm a little bit crossed up because of, of all the changes that happened over the weekend. So I'm going to have to go electronic, but I'll put it on the same screen. So I'm reading the same off the same document, or I'm at least reading off the same okay. screens. Okay. Uh, okay. Is it? It is uh, the pre-filed testimony. Um, the original pre-filed testimony. Yep. Okay. I'm sorry to state. Um, and question 31 is the question I'm interested in. What concerns do you have about unmerging the individual and small group market? Yes. Okay. So um, in your pre-filed <laughs> testimony, is it fair to say you express a concern of what might happen if the ARPA subsidies are uh, not extended? Yes. Um, and, and the, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say the concern is um, without the ARPA subsidies, I, the reason why the rate increase is 17% in the small group market or in the individual market and 5% in the small group market, um, I don't know, I don't recall the exact figures, but I believe it was in the ballpark of plus five minus five, so probably about in the ballpark of a 10% swing. Um, if the state of Vermont didn't somehow find a way to uh, continue offering those ARPA subsidies, because right now that 17% increase that we're passing through, um, a lot of that increase won't be experienced by policyholders in the individual market. Um, only people that are outside that range, um, as well as, you know, some people are actually going to benefit from it potentially because of, you know, the increased levels throughout the, throughout the FPL uh, chain. But if we were to, if the ARPA subsidies go away, we either need to remerge the market or pass on those full increases. Member policyholders in the individual market would experience it. So somebody feels like would end up losing, uh, whether it would be small small policyholders or individual policyholders. Thank you. But for the year um, itself, this is sorry. I was just going to say for the year no, itself, I think it's, it's it's great that we're able to you know I as Mr. Angoff gave kudos. Um, 
to me earlier for the vaccine assumption. I, I'll, I think it came, I don't know, I, I believe it came from HCA, but I thought it was a great recommendation for the year. Um, so. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any further questions. Okay, move on to member Holmes. Do you have questions for Matt? I do. Thank you. Hello, Matt. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is a pretty complicated year. I think we all can agree. Um, so some of my questions are probably going to be me trying to still untangle some of this. So let me start with some smaller questions. Um, the uh, long, with respect to administrative costs um, on exhibit one on page 17 in the filing it was discussed MVP is making additional administrative investments in the state for 2022 and then in exhibits 10 and 9 um, it's further detailed that these investments would be you know uh, quality improvement data analytics care management increasing care management staffing and capacity and I believe the total investment across the two markets is about 1.8 million dollars is that right I think it was 1.2 in one of the markets and 0.6 in the other market these are additional investments that are that counted sounds, in terms of that admin sounds, costs. That sounds yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess my question to you is, I would assume that MVP wouldn't make these investments unless it had expected some positive rate of return on these investments in terms of potentially lower costs and or higher quality. Um, so I'm wondering where in this filing is, if it's in this filing at all, is that net benefit in terms of lower costs or higher quality accounted for? And if not in this year, what is the expectation for lower costs in future years as a result of this investment. Um, is this something that we could go to executive session to to discuss? I think sure. That may be confidential, so I'd rather play it safe. Absolutely. I have some executive session questions anyway, so we'll just come back to that. That's great. OK. Uh, OK, also, if you look at um, Exhibit 17, which is the L&E rep report on page 15, I think it is. Um, let me just pull that up too. Um, there was, this was about administrative costs that were assumed in the 2021 filing of 4375. Um, and then um, budgeted, actually budgeted later in the year was, was 3743. Um, and so there was a big difference between what was assumed in the filing for 2021 and what actually later manifested in the budget for 2021. And there was a little discussion of this, the timing of estimates of admin costs in the Q&A in Exhibit 13. Yes. So I guess my question is, um, is the delta between what's assumed in the admin costs and what's budgeted later in the year typically as large as what was described in you know the 43 down to the 37. That seems like a large delta between what's assumed and what's actually budgeted later in the year. Can you tell yeah, me how that, that is? Yep, yeah, that, that is atypical is what I would say. Um, if you look at prior years, which we provide, um, and one, I think we were just on one of the exhibits where we actually provide a, a five-year summary or a four-year summary of actuals and expected. Um, where we've generally been within a dollar PMPM plus or minus uh, up or down from there. Um, what happened in 2021, in 2020, 2021, is um, we have our, our budget is assumed, our admin budget is developed. One is based on estimated costs of running the business based on um, cost center owners at MVP, meaning like the actuarial department would be a cost center, the legal department is a cost center, so on and so forth. If there's changes made to that, um, then that's just kind of, if there's changes made to those assumptions, then that can flow through into some of the components of the uh, admin charges. And then there's a, and then there's also a portion of it that just to think about the timeline, uh, which I think is what you're referencing, we come up with kind of a global admin budget when we're setting our rates because we're setting them so early in the year um, and then from august through january is when we finalize the budget for the upcoming year so at the time when we set our rates 
we are making an assumption about what we on a high level what it will cost to run our business and the best approximation that we have is the most recent data um, that that we have which would be like the supplemental health care exhibit or the statutory filings from the prior year um, when we were setting 2021 rates we had 2019 data and that data indicated that we were going to need an adjustment you know a small adjustment to the current admin structure the 2020 change kind of came unexpectedly um, presumably due to changes made in that cost allocation model as well as certain different um, investment projects and how they would impact certain you know lines of business over others for 2022 there are specific investments that we're making which you, you mentioned in the last question um, that we are we already know will be undertaking and that's why we're building in those specific costs in 2022. Okay, and, can you just point me to the exhibit where you have the um, assumed hmm. budget and actual for the past few years prior to 2021? Just So we don't actually, so I was, it is exhibit 10 is what I was thinking about. Um, on page 004. And this is just actuals. Um, but if we were to build in the expected amounts, you would see that excluding 2020, we've been pretty close to our, to our estimates. Okay, that would be really helpful if somebody could follow up just with that, with the expected relative to what the actuals were um, for that exhibit. That'd be helpful. Uh, thank you. Uh, what? My next question is kind of a new topic, actually. Uh, what premium impact, if any, uh, did you include in your filings uh, that would be due to the recent passage of the No Surprises Act, which providers basically prohibits providers from out of out of network surprise billing as of January 1st 2022 did that was that considered at all in your filing for 2022 it was not um it was not included I can't speak to the impact of surprise billing I know New York State has had that law a uh, surprise billing law in effect in a, for a few years um when we when that did go into effect we didn't see any huge changes um, in general because there were some don't it was some there was some amount but it was small it was nominal compared to the whole pie the whole cost of, of care because for the most part we have an adequate network um, and a sufficient network so there generally isn't a ton of surprise billing taking place um, where members are being balance billed Okay, well, I just noticed that the Congressional Budget Office estimates a reduction in cons commercial insurance premiums of between 0.5 and 1% when that, um, you know, act takes effect. So and we may have some follow up questions on that. Um, so this is this is related to, uh, you know, what to do with COVID. I think we're all obviously struggling with COVID in so many ways, both physically and actuarially. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I want to just ask you a little bit of probing. And I know Robin asked about this and, and um, the HCA attorney asked about this and Maureen did. But I want to ask you a little bit about the symmetry and the consistency in some of your assumptions. Um, as you've very, very clearly articulated in your, you know, in your testimony today and in your pre-file testimony that 2020 was a once in a lifetime extraordinary year in healthcare, right? Um, and, you know, it's, it's a year that you've chosen to use 2019 pre-COVID as the base period because 2020 was so anomalous. It's not reflective of future years. You know, claims were uncharacteristically low due to COVID, all of that. I guess I just want to understand what's going to happen going forward. Uh, my assumption would be that there would be symmetry in that assumption in that if 2021, as you've articulated already, reflects pent up demand and some of this deferred services on characteristically high claims, uh, you would also exclude 2021 in future filings as a base year, right, from which to trend forward. Because and you were talked a little bit about, you know, is this the new normal or is this pent up demand? Yep. Uh, 
but I want to understand how you're going to disentangle the two, because if you're omitting 2020 because it's anomalous, I would think 2021 is also anomalous. And how do you treat that going forward? Yeah, I think it's all the interwoven parts of 2020 that makes 2020 so challenging, in my opinion. Um, it's it's not it's the state of emergency with which I, I recognize we, there's still you know state of emergency in 2021, but prior off uh, restrictions as well as COVID lab testing. And then also importantly, this is a, this is impacting risk adjustment to normalize our claims. Pent up demand, the, the test, the items that we're seeing, I don't expect where we're seeing this pent up demand. Um, there's probably gonna be some additional diagnoses that would impact risk adjustment, but not to the same order of magnitude, I would, I would suspect. Um, COVID lab testing, that's something that when we look at it, we can isolate that figure out of our data um, and just remove it from the cost in 2021. So there, I think it's a cleaner adjustment using 2021 um, than it would be for 2020, just because I think there's a couple of items that don't flow directly into risk adjustment, such as 2020. So they're in the pent up demand. Again, we still haven't finalized with confidence because we haven't seen it taper off yet uh, since the, the end of the first quarter. Um, but assuming that we do see this, you know, tapering off of the, those services, I think those are more simple and clean and less interdependent adjustments to make to, to the claims. So I'm less concerned um, about 2021 versus 2020. Well, I guess I would be concerned about using 2021 as a base year uh, going forward for say 2023's filing. Uh, given all of the <laughs> given all of the potential for pent up demand and deferred services, even if you can carve out some of them. Um, so I guess I'm just going to put a, a, a footnote in that and that if you're going to treat 2020 as, you know, anomalous, I think 2021 is potentially anomalous too going forward in, in rate filings. Um, and I guess along those same lines, you know, you just mentioned that 2020 was anomalous because, for example, we had no prior authorizations, right? So um i would think that for example your pharmacy trend which is largely in part driven by 2020's pharmacy experience right of 21 percent um relative to the previous years that were you know under five percent growth in pharmacy again that seems anomalous potentially anomalous and yet you're using that as a part of your projection for pharmacy trend, but we've already determined that 2020 is anomalous, which is why you're starting with 2019. So to incorporate, to say, okay, well, we're going to use the pharmacy trend, which is really high in 2020 to project forward our pharmacy trend when you're not using any other medical claims in 2020 because it's anomalous, seems inconsistent. And I guess I would say part of, you know, my concern there is that, yes, there were no pre-authorizations in 2020. Specialty drugs often have pre-authorization, so it would not be surprising to see an upward tick in pharmacy trend potentially in 2020 because there was no, for example, pre-authorization. So how do you help me understand the usage of the 2020 pharmacy trend in an anomalous year? Yeah, it's, those are valid points. Um, it, it was surprising how much pharmacy was just not impacted by COVID, the way that medical claims were impacted by COVID. Um, but we've had extensive conversations talking about what exactly, why is this happening? Um, and there was a small component at why is this happening being wise pharmacy trending up at such a high rate. Um, there was a small component that we know is driven by the fact that, um, you know, there were a lot of 90 day scripts filled rather than 30 days. So there could have been a little bit of increased utilization, but that generally wasn't happening with, um, those were more maintenance drugs more than they were specialty drugs. Our understanding of what's driving up the specialty drugs is because of these new indications, um, which we may not necessarily ever be able to put back in place. So once a member is actually utilizing a specialty drug, it's hard to then, Say to the, say to that member, we're not going to allow you to utilize that drug anymore because now we have a prior off back in place. It may have improved their health, and it's probably going to lead to such an immense member dissatisfaction that it it's it's probably not worth it um, from a member health and from a member satisfaction standpoint. So 
going going forward, we don't expect that specialty spike in utilization to actually come back down at, at some point. But that would make no sense if new members are now afflicted with those ailments that require specialty drugs, they would presumably be subject to prior authorizations. And if those prior authorizations reduce some of the specialty drug utilization, you would expect that spike to come down for new members experiencing those specialty drug related afflictions once prior auth are back in place. Yeah, um, I mean, our so our pharmacy trends for 2021 and 2022 are lower than they were in 2020. Um, which I think has some, I, I would have to follow up with our PBM to understand exactly how they're factoring in prior auth and items like that. Um, but again, the state of emergency is rolling into 2021. So those new members are already utilizing those drugs. It's going to be challenging to, to remove them from the data, to remove their, sorry, to remove those new members from utilizing specialty drugs. Okay. Um... Well, I guess my concern is with the consistency, and even with the telehealth, um, my my concern about the telehealth is that you're using the third and fourth quarter 2020 experience to project claims going forward around telehealth. And isn't it possible that this too might be anomalous, that there is still some pent up demand, there still is some in-person fear of in-person visits uh, or fear of lingering fear of in-person visits. So. I guess my overarching concern, and I'll just articulate it, is that, you know, if 2020 is deemed too anomalous to use for claims experience, why are we relying so heavily on the pharmaceutical trend for 2020? And why are we using the second half of 2020 to project forward telehealth when it's clearly an anomalous year? So I'll just articulate that. Um, in your uh, pre-filed testimony, um, you, it's Exhibit 16, page 9. You discuss a marketplace primary care improvement program as the main vehicle through which MVP is promoting affordability, quality, and access in primary care. I'll wait till um, you get there, sorry. Page 9. It's your original pre-filed testimony, Exhibit 16. Are we there? Sorry. Um, Catching up on all these documents. Okay, I'm there. Okay, perfect. I just want to, I was surprised. Um, you, you discussed that providers are eligible for some financial incentives if their performance on a couple of cancer screenings and diabetic exams exceed the 50th percentile. Uh, but in 2020, only three providers in Vermont actually received that payment. Again, 2020 was an anomalous year, so perhaps it's because there was fewer screenings and fewer in-person visits and all of that happening. I'm wondering, um, it, it, what, did you do to have this program in 2019? I don't know if you remember this, but I'm just curious. Three seems like a really known number if the target is the 50th percentile. And actually, my question, two questions. One is, is the 50th percentile across, you know, both your New York and your Vermont provider network? Is it just Vermont's provider network? And were you surprised by that number three? And is that anomalous to uh, previous years in terms of the quality of primary care delivery in Vermont? So I, I believe in last year's pre-filed testimony, we provide similar data. Uh, from our clinical team provided that information. And I was surprised by the figure that it was, it seemed low. Um, but it wasn't that low, if I recall. Uh, I, I just I have a mental flag in my mind of it's lower than I would expect. Um, so in terms of you know outreach, I, I, I know our quality team is you know they perform outreach and try to provide provider education to improve upon um, those quality metrics because as you can improve quality, as you know, I'm sure you're aware, that can help reduce downstream costs, right? It, it reduces unintended low value care. Uh, improves member experience, improves population health, you know. So we provide these incentives in hopes of actually providing, you know, that the amount that we're paying out in incentives is more than offset by um, reductions in costs. But if I do recall from prior years, I, I the number has been low um, in the state of Vermont. So that must mean the 50th percentile is set, you know, 
jointly with the New York providers, right? So Vermont providers seemingly are are performing lower than New I York believe providers. It's based, not, I apologize. Um, yep, I believe it's based on national nationally published data. Okay, got it. Uh, General Counsel Barber, could I just check in briefly? Go ahead, Gary. Uh, this witness has been uh, answering questions for two hours since the last break. If, if it's, I'd just like to check in with him, see if he'd like a break, and just what your plan was to break. I don't want to break, obviously, in the middle of the board members questioning, uh, but just to get a sort of a, a sense of timing. Yeah, I was hoping we could get through board member questions, um, take a break, and then it sounded like there was some questions that may be appropriate for an executive session. So break for lunch, come back, do that. And uh, I don't know, I wasn't certain how to do the executive session in relation to redirect. Um, so if you have a preference on that. Um, but I was hoping to get through the board member questions before we take a, a lunch break. If, if we need to take a short 10 minute break here, happy to do that. I wonder if even uh, a five minute break now, just to, in case um, you know the obvious anyone needs a short break um, and then come back and then we won't be uh, rushed in any way. OK, I am going to admit that I don't remember where we broke, whether it was a question from Member Holmes or an answer from Mr. Lombardo. Yeah, I think I had my question answered. I just have a few more, but not very many. So hopefully we'll be able to at least I have a couple for executive session, but only a few more for this part of the hearing. OK. Um, this was with the next question is around case management. Um, in your pre file testimony, I think it's around page 11. You describe the case management program. My first question is actually who is eligible for a case manager? How is that determined? Um, I, it depends on the, the condition or um, the, the condition or the diagnoses that a member that a member has. So, okay, so it's risk, high risk patients. Um, it may not. It, I, I would say that's relative. You know, I think it, it could be it's it's members with condition chronic conditions in general or a specific uh, or a specific one time event that needs to be managed uh, to help ensure that they're getting adequate care, high quality care. OK, um, in that in your testimony there, you state that the case manager is again on page 11, will ensure members have access to information to support the selection of providers and facilities that will move members into systems in which standards of care are utilized effectively and will provide cost effective outcomes. So my question is, how does your team or how does the MVP team determine which providers and which facilities are utilizing care cost effectively and which are not? How are they determining, you know, basically high value care and how are they um, moving patients away from low value care? And that sounds like they're directing care uh, to high value places, right? Utilizing care effectively and providing cost effective outcomes. So how are they doing that? So the selection of the exact location is is not something that I could I could answer. Um, essentially, there, you know, my understanding of the program is it's utilizing it's it's member outreach um, to inform members of basically ensure that they're adhering to their medications and doing their follow up visits, um, as well as you know, again, it's it goes back to managing your care. And having high quality care is going to help, you know, lead to that triple aim of healthcare. Um, but the specifics of the program, like how are they choosing the exact location, that's something that I would have to defer to the case management team. Yeah, I, I mean, th these are all going to be related questions to this because I'm really trying to understand how MVP is directing care to low cost, high quality providers. And so, you know, your answer to the question touched on that in the MVP supplemental healthcare exhibit in their expense report. Um, MVP outlines quality improvement expenses, which include uh, physician profiling, performance review, chart review. There's discussion about medical policies and utilization management. And I'm trying to understand uh, on the ground 
how MVP is directing patients towards that high quality, low cost mm -hmm. care. Uh, and I'll just add another kind of subset to this question. In exhibit eight, page four, MVP was asked a question about low value care, right? Which largely is defined by unnecessary and harmful and costly care. Yep. Yes. Okay. And in that response, the first part of the response, it was addressing low value care requires education to members that more care is not equal to good care. So maybe to your clinical and case management team, I would love to know what steps they're taking to actually educate members about that. The second part of that response is a close partnering with providers who champion a focus on low value care. Um, you know, on low value care, the reduction is essential. So I, I, my question there is, how do you identify those providers, right? What criteria is used by MVP to identify those providers that are gonna deliver, you know, high value care, low cost, high quality care? And your third part of the answer there is, or the third part of that answer there is that you need downside risk, alternative payments and capitation is needed to reduce low value care. And again, if you look back to Robin's question and that, you know, the delineation of your contracts, none of them have downside risk, none of them have capitation in Vermont. So I, I'm trying to understand, and maybe this can just be a, a big, broad question for your clinical team, but in all of these areas, there's physician profiling happening, there's a recognition that education to members is important, different risk contracts are important, partnering with providers who identify as low um, cost, high quality care, but I'm not sure how you're actually executing that on the ground, how you're identifying providers and providers, you know, what steps is MVP taking to exclude providers who underperform on cost and quality? Are they moved out of the network? What if they're in a hospital? Does, does that, you know, provider no longer be included in the network. So a lot of questions were raised for me from some of these answers. And so I'm just going to bucket them all together. And perhaps somebody from your clinical care team can try and address that bucket yeah. of questions. And I can provide a little bit of background that I know we've done our New York population. We're actually starting to do this with our Vermont population is understand cost by ETG episode treatment groups. Um, so what we're doing is trying to compare um across our network how are what is the overall cost of managing a specific episode of care um by pro for provider a versus provider b versus the block of business average that's then trying that's then being balanced against quality so mm -hmm. we have quality metrics in place that we're also measuring um so over time i you know that is kind of the framework that we're using to evaluate how do we address our network and how do we steer our members on a high level? The actual detailed directing of the members I, I, is outside of my area of expertise. Okay, great. Thank you. I look forward to that. Um, I think the rest of my questions, Mike, are for executive session, potentially. Okay, why don't we talk about that after uh, Member Pelham and the chairman asked their questions because I need to understand a little bit more just the subject matter and how it might fit within the statute. Um, so go over to board member Pelham. Do you have questions for Mr. Lombardo? I do have a couple of kind of brief follow up questions. Uh, again, and kind of being near the end of the line, it's always helpful as uh, you have some very talented people <laughs> asking questions before me. Um, so my uh, uh, <clears throat> member Holmes just uh, read from uh, answers in Exhibit 8 um, having to do with um, um, you know, M MVP, MVP's approach to um, value-based care. And so uh, when I read that same language uh, you know, that she quoted, I um, um, began capitation was mentioned quite often and on the previous page you know to to uh in, in the exhibit the 29 percent caught my eye because it was still based on fee for service and there wasn't any kind of a uh, capitation explicit reference there and from my view capitation is the most powerful tool that we are that we have or one of the more powerful tools that we have in the foundations of healthcare reform in vermont because um, is foundational uh, to um, um, in you know in, induce 
providers to be innovative and creative. So I went looking for where are we now? Where this is narrative, aspirational narrative, but where are we now? And so my my question is is this um, a kind of a, in this regard a, a valid uh, a kind of calculation? So I went back to the in, index rate development for either the small group, you know, or the uh, individual. And uh, so that is in um, what I'm at now is is the index rate for small group, which is in uh, uh, exhibit two on page 144. And we've been here once before today already. Yep. Yeah, OK, I'm right there. there. So my yeah. question, my, I mean, I understand that this is an index rate. Um, I, I understand that it's, uh, you know, it's uh, based on uh, 2019 data, but I'm looking for a starting point that we that we can begin to measure measure uh, in this process uh, the kinds of questions that uh, Jess was just asking you. So I I look at um, the uh, line 13 where it says experience period capitation and non fee for service medical costs. So here's where capitation would be. And that was ten dollars and nine cents of you know of the developing experience here index rate. And the numerator of that would be um for the experience period the three hundred three hundred and eighty seven dollars and ninety cents. And so that is for the small group compliant, that's a 2.6% factor. And if we went to the, um, the, the same page, for the ACA compliant individual group, that would be a 2.9% factor. And so I look at numbers like that. And A, my question is, are those reasonable measures of the investment <laughs> in uh, capitated uh, um, uh, um, claims payment? You buy MVP, and if so, where would you expect a reasonable level to be that was significant and was influencing the market? Um, so first off, I that is a combination of <clears throat> claims that aren't processed through our claims operating system plus capitation amounts. Um, and we do break out those expected costs. So it's less than that amount is capitation. And I think capitation is actually a pretty low number. Um, it's essentially, I would say it's, we do make a capitated payment, uh, PCP incentive payment to our providers in one care. Outside of that, they're all just non fee for service claim expense items, meaning it's a claim or it's a, it's a surcharge like the state of Vermont has the paid claim surcharge. That's not necessarily processed in our claims operating system. So we add it on in this line item. So I would say, you know, capitation in general is, is actually an even lower percentage, um, significantly lower percentage. Um, I, I can say that I, I know that our um, our staff did spend some time um, with the URRT, the, I call them URRTs too, but yep. the URRT, and uh, um, found that for MVP, the calculation for in the individual was 2.15%, and for a small group, 2.31%. But because this document wasn't in the, in the record, that's why I went to um, this index rate yep. to try to uh, get, get, get my hands around a number that's meaningful and, and I either way you do it, it it doesn't seem meaningful to me and here we are three and four years into our healthcare reform effort um trying to change the system and 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 on the ground as Jess would say we're dealing in percentages that are pretty minuscule I would agree that they're you know it's in the range of one to two percent somewhere in that range and that's probably not going to have a huge influence overall. Um, MVP is fully committed to moving towards those kind of models because we believe that that will help improve population health and improve cost efficiencies and increase member satisfaction um, because then doctors can provide care, you know, rather than, um, you know, we can they can provide care rather than fill out charts and do things like that, right, for, for fee-for-service modeling. 
Um, at the end of the day, though, there has to be it's a two sided conversation. Um, that's a conversation I'm not really part. I don't participate in what my team works on is the actuarial side. They tell us the terms of the agreement and then we help um, you know, we, we help on the back end once the terms of the agreement are established. So I, I just think, you know, those conversations, it's a it's a two. It's either either there has to be both parties are willing to adopt a model and come to common terms or there has to be a mandate um, in place. So those are the two items I think can can, you know, without having somebody say you must do this or else you're going to face some sort of penalty, you have to come to common terms. Those are agreements and conversations that I'm not really I participate yeah. in every once in a while, but I'm not actually sitting at the table helping move those conversations along. And I do have it written down from, you know, board member lunch did um, did say that she's looking for us to bring somebody with us next year that can speak to that kind of information. And uh, I will bring that back to um, our executive team. Well, one of the things I would would suggest is that um, in last year's budget order for the ACO, we had a condition 15 put into that that asked them to provide us targets for, uh, you know, for um, capitation, et cetera. Um, and there's a draft memo I know that is in play, um, at, you know, as, as we speak. And it's looking at numbers in 2023 uh, in, you know, 25, 30%, um, and which begin to get to a critical mass that might have some influence. So I, I'm just, and I fully agree with you in terms of, of this being a carrier issue and a provider issue. And you know we, as a board, kind of operate on both sides of that, and and what where we can, you know, come come to uh, come to be a force to kind of bring these sides together is something I think we're all interested in. Um, the other question I had, again, um, uh, it's been touched upon, but it, it and it does go back again to um, Exhibit Eight. Uh, and we don't have to go there. It's the building question that um, with uh, um, um, for my Health Connect billing question. And I didn't know what the number was in terms of of, of the of, um, marginal cost to MVP uh, in in this arrangement. I, but I just want to understand the arrangement a little bit more. This these are functions that Diva performed, and now the carriers have agreed to assume the work that diva did um and your estimate is i think as i understood it was that it, it's a cost um in this rate hearing uh, of about three hundred thousand dollars um mar that's the marginal cost the incremental cost um from the filing and i'm wondering if you have any idea how much diva uh saved relative to the um, duties that you folks picked up. Um, I am not aware of of how uh, of what Diva's costs were um, for these programs. But uh, I guess my concern, uh, and I didn't have to have a, I should have had it, but I, I missed it. I didn't have a a full focus on on the number. But to me, at any level, this is cost shift. You know, we all badmouth the cost shift, but this is cost shift. This is. This is taking a, a cost that a state agency had and um, and and paid for with both federal and state funds and shifting it on onto ratepayers and premiums. And I just think whether it's large or small, um, it's just a bad practice and and something that um, I'm concerned about in the grand scale, um, but also um, <clears throat> more you know at, at the at the at the smaller scale. And just one other kind of contextual question here: Are you the legislature in the in the budget this year passed legislation to take a relook at the uh, benchmark plan, which is the foundation for the plans that we're we're discussing here today? And um, there is a report back to uh, Department of Financial Regulation um, uh, on January fifteenth by January fifteenth of twenty twenty two. And I'm just wondering, does MDP have an approach to this? Um, the specific language in the bill says, uh, assess whether the benchmark plan is appropriately aligned with Vermont's health care reform goals regarding the population health and prevention. 
So that's one broad mandate. And then it has five or six additional benefits that they would like to have considered as part of the benchmark plan. And I'm just wondering how far along your, your thinking might be in terms of um, engaging in, in this process. Yeah, I, I think we're waiting. Um, I know there was some early conversations a month or two ago um, that I, I believe the board and uh, you know the board had, had, had participated in. Um, I think it was a, actually a call and they had joined. Um, but since then, I, if I recall, there's a series of meetings that have just recently been set up, um, and we're you know we're we're waiting to listen to um, you know to. The Vermont regulators to, you know, we're, we're thinking about things right now, um, and if we think that there's actually any significant modifications that we can make, um, but we're gonna and we plan to participate in those conversations. Um, I know our product design team is fully is going to be fully engaged in them in our government affairs. Um, the actuarial team will come in and help them out and supplement when we have to provide, you know, rate analyses and rate um, estimate impacts. So we will be participating at this point, though I can't provide much more detail on um, the current status. Okay. And those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, do you have questions? You're on mute, Kevin. Kevin. You're on you're on mute. Is that better? <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> My neighbor has been uh, weed whacking or something, so I've been on mute. Um, my apologies. Um, as Tom said, uh, when you go uh, last, uh, most of your questions have been answered, but I want to go back to a few of the previous questions and maybe ask them in a little bit different way. Um, starting with um, how you manage your prescription uh, spend, and you talked about using um, CVS, and you talked about your um, um, mid-market checks and uh, so forth, and that you thought that you were getting a good deal. Um, Maureen asked you, um, when you thought the next RFP would be, and you didn't know, just curious if you know when the last RFP was. A specific date, I don't recall. Um, a few years ago, though, I, you know, few being a little bit of a wide range. Um, if the specific date, I, I, I don't recall, but I know that I helped participate in some of those conversations. Um, and analyze of the financial impact. OK. Um, on that same uh, um, topic, you're using CVS Caremark. Um, what protections are in your contract with them to make sure that um, their pharmacies aren't advantaged over other pharmacies? That would have to be something that I would I would have to look into the contract terms and work with the pharmacy team to to uncover that. I think that's um, one of those in the details contract pieces of information, how they're structuring their discounts, if there is a difference in structure discount by P, uh, by pharmacy, or if it's just a broad discount that's applied across all the, all the all pharmacies and it's universal. Yeah, it's just hard not to focus on uh, that pharmacy uh, trend when. Uh, it, it just really jumps right out at you. Um, next uh, line of questioning, um, and again, um, you were questioned earlier about l and um, talking about 800 new members. I think uh, maybe it was member Holmes questioned you on your concern about uh, um, the elasticity of your numbers, given the, the changes in uh, pricing and We've seen that, uh, you know, in 2016, you had 10% of the market and uh, now you're up to 50%. Um, when I started in 2017, you had a little bit over 10,000 members. Now you have over 37,000 members. Um, just cons if you've seen um, 
you know, the, the different uh, um, filings that have been put in between you and your competitor. Do you have concerns that I know you said that you and I appreciate that you're you feel that if you provide good quality service that Vermonters probably may not uh, flee, but they left your predecessor when they came to you. And I'm, I'm just uh, trying to, you know, you've got l &E with the 800 new members. There's concern on with your higher pricing if you're losing mm -hmm. memberships. Um, I mean, what are your thoughts on this? And could it drive up your administrative costs if you were to lose members? Yeah, um, yeah, those are fair. Those are fair and very good questions. Um, I mean, obviously, there's some level of concern. Um, you know, to to gain twenty seven thousand members in a matter of a few years is something that we've been proud of. Um, we don't want to watch, and you know, we don't want to watch those members leave us and walk out the door. Um, how it would impact administrative costs. I think it would, it's too early to to come up with any sort of adjustments or speculate on that impact. Um, you know, we have been having conversations with our sales team, but everything is based on preliminary proposed rates. Um, so again, we're, we're trying to be patient and wait till the final approved rates to see how we stack up uh, to really try to pinpoint what we think is going to happen in 2022. Um, but, you know, when we set our rates, as long as risk adjustment is working to some extent um, for the largely working, then we're normalizing our populations. Then we're competing on how well are we managing our costs, whether that's through admin or care management and case management or unit cost contracting. Um, we are, though, you know, again, your point is valid that we are. How concerned are we? I would, you know, I wouldn't say incredibly concerned because I think we're reasonably aligned based on proposed rates and. We've looked at what the l and &E recommendations are, um, as well as the impact on the hospital budgets. And we think that we're going to be pretty reasonably aligned. And, it, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're, op we're optimistic that we'll be somewhere in the same range of membership going forward. OK, the question of pent up demand has been beat pretty hard, but I'm I guess I'll uh, just follow up on it one more time. And just to ask you if you've done any surveys of providers to um, try to get a handle on when the pent up demand will have been met. So obviously people weren't going in for their colonoscopies and mammographies and all that kind of stuff. Um, but but what type of backlog are you hearing about from providers and when should that expect to end? I haven't participated in any conversations with providers. Um, I don't know if our clinical team or our contracting team has been having those conversations. Um, you know, that would be something I'd have to ask them if they've had those conversations. We are monitoring, though, the actuarial team every month. Um, when our data, when we get our monthly refresh of our claims, we know the the services, the types of services that are hitting us, that we're seeing the increases. And the first thing that we, one of the first things that we do once our claims come in is we loop through our uh, SQL code and we analyze how are, how are these costs changing as, as time is going on. Um, March, April, and May were extraordinarily high in those, in those handful of buckets. Um, we are seeing a little bit of a dip in June, but it's also, you know, um, as we talked about earlier, the IBNR factor on on the first month is like a 2.8 factor is what we had earlier, right? So it's almost triple whatever we've actually paid. So it's hard to actually analyze how June is gonna 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 look. Um, again, every month, this is something that similar to board member lunch asking about direct enrolled members. Um, we can, you know, to the extent that we can provide any feedback to you guys throughout the year, we'd be happy to do that. Right now, though, the, the data that we have is showing that it's not continuing to rise because what we first saw in March was, oh no, it's spiking up. Like how, what is it was the first thing. Cause at first you just saw the total dollar amount spiked up. Then when we started drilling into it, we said, okay, well, hopefully this is just pent up demand of services. But then it became a question of, is it gonna continue to rise or is March and April, are those gonna be the high points? Um, I think it's too early to call right now, um, but we're hoping and what the 
most recent data is showing is that there could be a leveling off or a slight decline. Um, but it also could be this new normal, which is the thing that we actually fear. So, you know, I'm we're more than happy to provide some update information as the year goes on. If if that's something that you guys that will be helpful for you guys. I think it would be good to hear from the providers and see what their their belief is and what their backlog is. But um, my next question, um, given that the premium um, tax credits or subsidies are through ARPA are tied to that uh, second low cost silver plan, which happens to be your product. Um, have you had internal conversations about that and how it will affect uh, things? Um, yeah, I mean, we've we've taken a look at where you know we will be with our proposed rates, and I think we would still have the second loss cost silver plan um, and just tried to model out. We don't know exactly where the premium which premium level everybody is at right now. Um, but what we do, what we do have an understanding of is how is that going to change? Um, you know, how are how are members actually going to be impacted based on various FPLs? Um, so I don't have the spreadsheet in front of me, but that is something that once approved rates are out or even proposed rates, yeah, we, we do take a look at that to try to understand how members receiving subsidies are going to be impacted. So there's been a lot of conversation uh, today about um, um, whether you benefited um, from the uh, pandemic. Um, we had a conversation about uh, um, your payout being less than 90%, um, but then you talked about you're seeing this uh, um, larger, more current payout. On January 7th, Governor uh, Phil Scott here in Vermont um, announced that he was charging the Department of Financial Regulation to do an analysis to see whether or not um, a rebate would be in order for um, insurance customers. And um, of course, we at the board thought that we would receive uh, um, some information on that probably in a 75 to 120 day window, but we didn't get that until towards the end of last week. And in that report, have you seen that report that DFR issued? They uh, DFR shared with us a report, I believe last Thursday or last Wednesday. Um, but I, there was some information missing. I, I, I believe they just removed some of the uh, carrier specific data from the other carriers. Um, but they did share with us the report for MVP to understand if we want to redact anything. Um, which so I, I I did read through that MVP specific portion of the report. Were you involved with conversations with DFR's actuary um, Oliver Wyman in the preparation of that report? We've supplied data to um, to prepare to help prepare the report. We didn't participate at all in the actual preparation, obviously. Um, but yeah, we we did supply the data uh, to the DFR actuaries. So in that report, um, and it must have come from data that you supplied to their consultant, there's um, mention of a $24 million um, underwriting um, problem. And I'm curious, um, does that just include Vermont? Um, I would have to pull up the report itself to see where that, where that uh, calculation is coming from. We'll go to it right now. Do you do you recall? And the pages may be thrown off because of. I don't recall, unfortunately, because of the timing of that report. Um, it was a quick read. Yeah. OK, yeah, I don't recall seeing that 24 and 20. And it says in 20 the. Underwriting loss. Um, I am not specifically seeing that figure. Um, they did, they did quote a projected loss for 2021, but we only provided limited information to them for 2021. We provided, 
uh, and they're forecasting the report that I'm seeing is showing that their forecasted loss is a $21.7 million loss, if I'm reading this correctly. I'm trying to skim it at the same time as well. <laughs> it's a, yeah, looking at section 4.1. Okay, under um, I'm glad you pointed out that section because um, that's a follow-up question they had with you as well because it's talking about the risk adjustment payment and um, you talked about um, A little bit of that earlier, but we saw that Luke, your competitor, talked about uh, the fact that uh, they have a healthier um, population now. So, I guess one would assume, since that you you're dealing with this pool of Vermonters, if they have a healthier population, that MVP must have a a less healthy population. And um, if that's the case, will you get a larger risk adjustment payment? Yeah, I don't. So I guess I don't understand how um, how they drive that. Uh, I guess as a percentage. So when we initially started growing market share, we saw our percentage payment into the risk adjustment program start spiking up. In 2020, that figure came down a little bit. So that may be what they're implying is that um, you know we. I would expect that we're still going to be significant payers. I think overall we have. If you were just to take our population versus their population, we are going to be payers into risk adjustment. But the new members that may have come into the market for each carrier, uh, it's flattening out a little bit, but not to the extent that it's going to swing everything um, as much as one would, you know, as maybe was led on to. Um, I'm based on our payment in 2020. It's a little bit of a more favorable population, a little bit closer to the market wide average, but it's not materially. We're still we're still significant payers. We still paid over 20 million into risk adjustment. OK. So those were the questions I had, uh, hearing officer. Thank you. OK, Mr. Angoff, Mr. Carnegie, I um, I think now would probably be a good time to break and we can come back uh, from the break and expect to go into an executive session uh, followed by redirect would be my expectation. Does that sound agreeable? Sounds fine with uh, the healthcare advocate. So I, um, I think the question is how long of a break should we take? Uh, an hour or half an hour? And I, I think we have enough time to get through everything. So we're, whereas we could take an hour, but I'm happy. I would advocate for the shorter time frame. Go shorter if folks want to go shorter. I, I, I would agree with that. Sounds good. OK, um, before we break, I would like to understand a little bit better. Uh, the questioning and answering <laughs> without disclosing any uh, confidential information, the, the, the kind of nature of what we would be discussing in an executive session. So I understood Jessica, you had some questions and I believe I heard someone else mention that they might have some questions about confidential materials. Jess, could you help me understand sure. a little bit? Well, I, one of my questions, um, which I asked Mr. Lombardo, Lombardo was around the administrative uh, investments. So I guess that's 
for for his reasons preferred to be an executive session. My own questions were around hospital specific reimbursements and some of the confidential documents that we received. Okay. Did, was I mistaken that there was another board member who might have a question about confidential materials? Looks I like think I asked about something that I wasn't sure if it would be confidential or not, and it was not, which is the telehealth exhibit. Okay, so the hospital specific reimbursement information that we received has been determined to be exempt from public inspection and copying under the Public Records Act, and there is a exemption uh, in the Open Meetings Act uh, allowing you to go into executive session to discuss that. Um, regarding the administrative investments in Vermont, I think I need a little bit more explanation of how that might uh, fit into the executive session criteria. So, Gary, if you want to talk with Matt about that during the break and help me understand that when we return, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. So to be clear, um, Mike, are you, are we coming back to this setting so that you can have that conversation and then we'll leave this setting and go to the executive session setting? We need to. We need to have a, a discussion and vote in an open setting before we uh, before someone makes a motion to go into executive session. So yeah, I would expect we would come back, have a brief conversation, uh, and then go directly into the executive session. And could I ask a, a question, Microsoft Teams question then? Are you, you then invite us into the other section and we click on that or do we need to go out to our calendar? Uh, you would need to click on the invite to the executive session that was distributed earlier. Um, so we'd all leave this uh, meeting. It would continue to run. Um, and then we would all, you know, once the executive session is closed, come back and rejoin the, the public session. Thank you. Uh, and like I said, we'll have a brief um, discussion of the, the bases. There need to be some votes and. Um, so. Um, why don't we all break? at this point and come back at uh, 1.35.